Hello and welcome to the Baka Gaijin Show. I'm your lovable rascal of a host, Zeke Freak, and with me, as always, is the indomitable co-host, Kevin Faulkner. I really got to start thinking of those in advance. <laughs> You've said this, like, multiple times over the course of the years we've been podcasting, and you still can't remember it. <laughs> I actually have a list, but I keep forgetting to check it. <laughs> That's also something you've said before. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, at this point, it's probably pretty outdated. And yes, I know that's a thing I've said before. <laughs> Say a it's lot of things. The re Shit, reality who's of that? podcasting. <laughs> and with us now, uh, guest and friend of the show in the mythical... We have a passenger with us on the con... Under the show, QB the Third. Hello, and this is Adam Sandler. Hi, <laughs> Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler? <laughs> Hi, this is Adam Sandler. Sessler, and I'm here to talk to you about my my review of Otogi. Otogi, Otogi, Otogi. <laughs> I was gonna say Adam Sandler. We're going. Up, we're getting up in the world, and then you said Adam Sessler. I'm like, oh, we. It's kind of a downgrade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or or is it an upgrade? No, no. <laughs> mm. I mean, Adam Adam Sessler was on TV, so you know, yeah. kind yeah. of an upgrade. You know, G4 is back now, kind of. Yeah, this kind of as a streaming thing, I guess. Not really as a channel, just a streaming thing. I think they have a channel too. Uh, like an actual TV channel? No, thing? no, I'm, no, I'm like a YouTube channel. I meant. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I thought I they were back as a TV channel. It was like not because I was like thinking. God, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Make cable worth subscribing for. God dang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Paying. God, what is what even is cable like eighty a month or something? Uh, depends it's on easy. Pretty dang expensive, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, like even a, e even like the alternatives like YouTube TV or whatever, those are up to like sixty bucks now. So you might as yeah. well just get regular ass cable. Yeah, I haven't had cable in like twelve years. <laughs> I've forgotten the struggle. It's been a while uh, for me too. It, yeah, I haven't had cable in about a year. I I miss tsunami, you know. Yeah, see, it's conversations like this is why G4 doesn't have their own channel again. <laughs> yeah, we I'm, are I'm willing... the audience for G4. Yeah I'm, will... yeah, I'm willing to bet their target demographic specifically cut the cord a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanted to stay on the cord for a long time, but I just couldn't keep up with Toonami anymore because of, you know, personal reasons. So, you know, there's that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, Kevin, what have you been up to lately? Quite a bit lately. So, um, for, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about it later, but uh, Star Wars it's... Visions came out, and I saw mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I have... you've, seen it tw you've seen it twice now. Yeah, I rewatched it today, actually, to kind of get it fresher into my memory. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, uh, again, I'll get into it later, but... Uh, some of my opinions on these shorts have actually shifted after my second viewing. So that I've, should be fun. I've got shit to talk about. Ooh. Yeah. Um, this so is the most dedicated I've, I've seen you for a podcast topic before, because we've had podcast topics where I'm like, Kevin, I need you to put together a top five list. And then he's like, well, I got three after <laughs> I gave you like two weeks advance notice. Yeah, so this that, is I do impressive. that. <laughs> this is impressive. Hopefully I can keep it. I'm not going to keep this up. I can't. No. <laughs> this is an absolute fluke. Never going to happen again. Mm -hmm. um, Enjoy it while it lasts. But yeah, um, the other day I also watched the first episode of the second season of Symphogear, Symphogear G. Um, mm -hmm. Oh my god. Uh, that's a hell of a way to open an episode. I can't spoil anything. But... I know, right? Oh man. I, I love I, I love first episodes that just lay out everything that you're going to be getting for the rest of the season in just the first episode. That is a great mm -hmm. way to hook the viewer. It's just like, mm -hmm. this is what you're in for. Have fun. <laughs> I like second episodes that tell you everything in the first episode was actually a lie. That's my favorite. Ah, that's uh, interesting. Hurt your expectations. Mm -hmm. I am... I... I that phrase is cursed now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ryan. <clears throat> Thanks, Ryan Johnson. 
<laughs> Which, uh, speaking of that, um, you guys went through the sequel trilogy together. Uh, go on that. Oh, God, yeah. You and I finally ripped the Band-Aid off, and yeah. we watched The Rise of Skywalker. Yeah. We didn't watch the whole sequel trilogy together. That would have... With with how shitty my connection was that day, well, that would have been really painful. But, oh, uh, I'm sure. No, it was just Rise of Skywalker. But to be fair, that's enough pain for any one man, so... Rise of Skywalker has single-handedly tanked the reputation of the rest of the sequel trilogy in, to in, to in totality. Yes. And, like... See, here's the thing. My my list of Star Wars movies used to be, like, you know, kind of all over the place. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. of course, I have stuff like, you know, Empire, and then A New Hope, and then Revenge of the Sith. But, like, the, the rest of the movies used to be, like... You know, kind of a mix between you know the sequel trilogy, you know, a couple of a couple of sequel movies are you know a little bit up there, like Force Awakens, uh, and you know a, a couple of the prequels are you know down there. My least favorite Star Wars movie used to be Attack of the Clones. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. anymore. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Rise of Skywalker is so goddamn awful that. Mm -hmm single-handedly it brought down the rest of the sequels with it and now all three of them are lower than attack of the clones on my list well you know what arcata says the ending is paramount it kind of is and that's yeah. really it just god that movie was painful to watch and the only reason i was able to get through it is because i had this dude talking with me the entire mm -hmm. time just us commiserating in pain the entire yeah. time I, mean, I gotta I, say this, not yeah. enough weed would convince me to watch that fucking movie, even with you <laughs> lights and my setup. Yeah you, yeah, you said something interesting about, like, you know, this movie compared to The Last Jedi, if I remember correctly, Zeke. Is it that I said it, this, I'm, I feel, I've watched the movie and I still feel like I haven't seen the movie, because the movie is edited like it's just a bunch of trailers. <laughs> it is. Yeah! But what sticks in my mind, in particular... What really sticks in my mind is you said, um, I'll give The Last Jedi one thing. I actually finished it. And you said right. that if, if you had watched Rise of Skywalker in theaters, you'd have walked out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I, 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 I actually went to see uh, The Last Jedi by myself and spent like the $15 or whatever AMC wants for the nice chairs, you know. Um, yeah, I went to the IMAX myself with a few with a few boys of mine. Yeah, I saw I saw um, Force Awakens with friends, but I saw Last Jedi by myself. I regretted it. I regretted spending the money that I did, <laughs> but at least I it was at least I I wanted to know what the fuck was happening in that movie enough to actually sit there and sit through it. Yeah, uh, Rise of Skywalker. I would have absolutely walked out. That is yeah, a barely coherent blob of a cinematic abortion it's not good it's like really you not know, good I, feel, I have never walked out of any movie ever that has never had i but i'm pretty sure if had i have seen this in actual theaters i probably would have asked for my money back right then and there yeah yeah, yeah. dude i yeah i wanted my money back and i didn't even pay it. okay technically speak, okay i didn't personally pay to watch it i, I don't pay right, for disney yeah. plus <laughs> right yeah me that, neither. I use my sister's account. I forget. That said, uh, Rise of Skywalker is a very pretty movie. I mean, we don't account share Disney. Don't. That was a joke. Ha 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 ha. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> yeah, we don't share accounts ever. Mm. Ever. So, okay. Okay. I think they're gone. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah. So that was a not that was a not fun time. Well, it was a fun time because you were there. Like like I like I told you, it's like state sanctioned torture. It's better with friends. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's how it be sometimes on this bitch of an earth. Mm -hmm. Yep. So aside from willingly castrating yourself, what else have you been up to? <laughs> <laughs> Damn near. Jeez. And <laughs> aside from that, um, most of what I've been up to is just. I've been relaxing a lot more. Yeah. Just just taking time to calm down, just you know, unwind. I've been spending a lot more time on YouTube lately, just watching yeah. random videos and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um I started up on Halo 3 recently though. 
Only, uh, the campaign, you mean? The campaign, yeah. I've been playing the multiplayer for a while now, but this is the first time I've actually, like, actually played the campaign. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. must say, this is quite good uh, so far. Mm, yeah. I've only gotten, like, two levels in, but I'm liking what I'm playing so far. And me and I too have gotten more into Halo recently since I uh, fixed my uh, my computer recently. It, it was having a lot of uh, issues, and now I'm able to play Master Chief Collection on my PC again and be able to play some multiplayer with the boys and suck ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, me, and Saradin uh, get together pretty frequently uh, to play Master Chief Collection. It's uh. It's pretty fun. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a ball and good time. Uh, but yeah, that's roughly what I've been up to lately. Not a whole lot, but uh, certainly enjoyable. Uh, hey mm -hmm. Zeke, what have you been up to? I uh, I've been doing some 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 video games, as they're called. I've I've been told. As you typically do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of video games there, Zeke? Uh, recently I beat over this past weekend in between watching one part of visions and another and the uh, the rest of it uh, I beat Cana bridge of spirits uh, which I enjoyed um, it's a it's a uh, it's a pretty good eight to nine hour uh, sort of 3d platformer adventure adventure style kind of Zelda like but not really mm. Um type of game that uh, got a lot of attention for its uh, quote-unquote Pixar quality uh, cinematics. Um, this is the, this is the first game by Animation House Ember Labs. Uh, you might know them from that Majora's Mask fan film they did a few years ago. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think it's a very pretty and beautiful game and it's presented really well. I don't think the story is quite at the level of the presentation though. Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do with, and I saw, I saw a review that said this before I started playing and I'm like, well, I'll judge that for myself. And after playing, I'm like, yeah, they were right. Um, which is that the, I think the main weakness is actually Kana herself because, uh, she is likable, but you don't learn much of anything about her. There's not like a compelling central through line for like the protagonist. And I actually have a conspiracy theory about that, Ooh. which is that, which is, yeah, I know, one down eye. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have a conspiracy theory that I think originally, and I could be completely wrong. I, I know nothing about this team. I don't know anything. But I think originally they wanted Kana to be like a silent protagonist, kind of like a kind of like Link. Uh huh. Who, um, and have the story be told mostly through helping these uh, these various spirit these like um, raging spirits you know find peace and whatnot. I mm -hmm. think I think they might have originally wanted that, but then later on they decided to make her an actual character and add like voice acting and stuff. <laughs> but like it was late enough in production where like I don't think they could really rewrite what they had written all that much. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of comes across as they just kind of injected her being a character late into development that's what i think ah, anyway because okay. otherwise i find it a little bit hard to imagine why you wouldn't at least give your protagonist something in a game named after them <laughs> um yeah i think i think like the individual stories of the spirits you help and whatnot are compelling and it's all presented beautifully Mm -hmm. But like that lack of a central through line, I think that really hurts it. And then like it, it, it knocks it down from being, I think what a lot of people expected, sort of like a, a, um, I really fucking hate the phrase Pixar quality game because <laughs> people have been saying that since the New York times called tools of destruction that in 2007, but it feels like we keep redefining what that means. <laughs> It doesn't help that, like, the standards of CG animation keep fucking changing. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. It's just like, and also, you gotta remember, Pixar doesn't use a single graphics card either. They use render farms, for Christ's yeah. sakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me and Zeke actually talked about that regarding, like, the cinematics for Kana. Yeah. And how a lot of so, people are like, you know, fucking... Uh, Why is the frame rate so low? <laughs> I'm like, well, it's a normal fucking movie. It's 24. It's a normal fucking movie frame rate. It just looks weird because you were playing 60 FPS a moment ago. Yeah. Yeah, I can see why that would be a little jarring, but... It's not you know, necessarily you... a problem, though. Yeah. 
No, not everything needs to be 60 FPS yeah. or 120 yeah. FPS. Oh, God. Even fucking, I, I told Kevin this earlier, so I'm sorry for pre-spoiling Kevin on everything I'm going to bring up in the show. <laughs> but I even the guys, even one of the guys at Digital Foundry was like, they should re-render the cutscenes at 60 FPS. And I'm like, are you a fucking idiot? Do you not know how animation works? This is the same dumbass that watched the friggin' PlayStation presentation, saw that one fucking Korean mm -hmm. game and was yeah. like she's too sexualized for today's gaming. I think it was Chinese, but yeah. Yeah, it's it it, it was stupid either way cuz it's like yeah. oh she's too sexualized for today's gaming culture and it's like where do funny you get off that? Dumbass? The funny thing about that was she was barely showing any skin. It was just like she had like skin tight like sci-fi pants on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like how is oh my god, fucking yeah. Speaking of China, though, uh, the other game I beat this weekend was uh, one of the first of PlayStation's China Hero, China, uh, China Hero Project. Uh, oh. I, don't, I don't know if I've ever explained what that is on the show, but there's basically an initiative in China uh, that Sony is heading up where they're investing in smaller Chinese studios to help promote their games. That's why that uh, Chinese uh, game was at the PlayStation experience. But the one yeah. I beat uh, was Fist Forged in Shadow Torch. <laughs> the, um, you can't say it any other way, Kevin. You have to say it with with gusto and enthusiasm. Yeah, it's not Fist Forged in Shadow Torch. It's Fist Forged in Shadow Torch. Fist Forged in Shadow Torch. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the Metroidvania where you play as a anthropomorphic rabbit with a giant metal fist attached to his back. Mm -hmm. uh, which, mild spoilers, you also get a giant drill on your back and a giant electric whip on your back later in the game. So that's a pretty good fucking selection of weapons. That sounds fucking amazing. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a really solid Metroidvania. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like it. It's very pretty. It runs at 4K60 on PS5. Mm. Um, it's a really pretty Unreal 3 sort of diesel punk aesthetic. And they actually, like, one thing I really like about the game, I think I said this on Twitter, is that even the UI is like diesel punk where it's like a it's like a diesel punk tablet device but it's got like hard switches oh, it's kind of like a kind of like, like yeah kind of like Fallout's pit boy and like you what? see like the the HUD elements are like rustic and um you know they look like you know clanker tech you know I like to call you know I like to call that sort of aesthetic like clanker tech sort of like uh the original Ratchet and Clank had before they went standard sci-fi yeah mm -hmm. um that, that's actually an interesting thing is the uh, the original Ratchet and Clank had like a very like uh, clanky sort of almost Star Star Wars like Star Wars has a lot of clanker tech too. It does. And, like, it was actually like mostly yeah. the, mostly the original like mostly the original trilogy. Yeah. Um, and like there's like a, there's like CRTs in original Ratchet and Clank, which is always weird to think about uh, because of what comes later. But yeah. Anyway, Diesel Punk full of clanker tech. I had some issues with how the game balances its combat, but uh, I, th I think the exploration is really good. The movement feels really good. The environments are varied. Uh, it's really fun to play. The combat, especially now that they patched in a easy mode, which I like to call the less bullshit mode, <laughs> because I don't, I it is no, easier. Mode. Yeah, because I think, I think the normal difficulty just isn't very well balanced. And I, I said this in the Discord server, but there's an ambiguity between what attacks are interruptible and what will knock you on your ass. And it seems like there's a weird priority given as to whether your attack cancels an enemy's attack or an enemy's attack goes through and cancels your attack. So it doesn't feel super polished in that regard. But on the easier mode that they patched in, it's forgiving enough that you can kind of bulldoze your way through that and it becomes more fun and you can experiment with the different options because before that I had to play in like a really safe kind of boring way and I didn't get to like explore the combat system as much. Uh, but I feel like with the easier setting, you're able to actually use those options, which made the game a lot more enjoyable without being without actually like being complete pushover. You obviously have to know what the fuck you're doing still. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I beat those two, and then I've started up on Lost and Random, uh, the EA original from the same studio as uh, the uh, Faya. And also, I just randomly yesterday, uh, Easyscape, the speedrunning channel, uh, did a partnership with Sony where they were giving off fifty percent off codes for Sackboy: A Big Adventure. So I picked that up. I was one of the. It was one of those codes with like the first two thousand people to use this code get the discount. I was actually one of them. So, okay. Yeah, I got that deal. Good deal. Very nice. 
Yep. And of course, uh, Metroid, Metroid Dread's coming out soon as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's next mm -hmm. month. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's going to be fun. Uh, so, Zeke, uh, yeah. how about that death loop? How are you doing on that? Right. Uh, I've actually taken a bit of a break from that because uh, I did a thing where I think I might have said this last time, but I finished up all the remaining DLC for Borderlands 3 and I kind of got shootered out at that point. So I was like, yeah, I want I want to hop on platforms for a while. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's me. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you I, also like hopping on platforms? I also like hopping on platforms and occasionally jumping between Ooh. them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also like flying a ship between those platforms, too. Ooh. Hmm. Interesting. Sometimes if people, if people try to obstruct my path when I'm trying to hop on platforms, I'll punch them in the face. Or I will stomp on their head. Or shoot them. Um, or shoot with, them. With, with lemons. <laughs> yeah, lemons! <laughs> or Riding on cars! <laughs> Huh. Yeah, but yeah, that's mo that's mostly. Also, I've been um, uh, season five of My Hair Academia finished, and I've I've bi I've been binging the manga from that point on. Uh, really good stuff after where that leaves off. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've heard the most. Yeah, I've heard the most recent arc is actually like really really good. Yeah, I'm catching up quickly. Uh, I in the last two days I went through probably four or five volumes worth and i'm like now 30 chapters behind so catching up pretty quickly Ooh, nice i need to still start on my hero academia because uh i'm going to be seeing uh the movie that's going to be coming out in theaters i i believe at the end of october with a, with a friend of mine oh world heroes yeah. mission yeah world heroes mission yep i'm going to be seeing that with a, with a friend of mine so mm -hmm. i think it's time that i uh bulk up on uh on my hero academia just so i can know yeah. what the fuck is going on rather than just okay beer and nachos here we go <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh I'm, I'm just remembering now that the first two movies two heroes and heroes rising have sort of a uh, a Ben 10 race against time slash um, what's the other god damn it you know what I'm talking about Kevin yeah, yeah, like, like yeah, where the, yeah. the titles are mixed uh, a, 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 uh, race against time and secret of the omnitrix right but secret of the omnitrix is a race against time but race of race against time is about a secret of the omnitrix and <laughs> the first two my hero academia movies have the same problem where two heroes sorry where heroes rising is about two heroes Whereas arguably two heroes is about heroes rising. <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean? <laughs> it's weird. It's a whole fucking, yeah. You know. At least then, at least there, I can kind of get like a like It's like a language thing, kind of. You know, yeah. like no English, no English. You know, company would name their movie World Heroes Mission. You know, <laughs> that's right. You know, so there's like a language thing, but the Ben Ten movies had no fucking excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, Kubey, what have you been up to? Um, okay. So, uh, uh, besides, you know, from playing Halo with the boys, uh, just and watching Visions, of course, uh, I haven't really been doing a whole lot, although I've been, uh, searching for a new job, and I believe the new job, and I believe my search has come to an end, and I'm going to be, uh, Finally, uh, working at a new job, going to be uh, working as a secur security officer uh, at a at, at a library. So that's going to be really, really fun. Uh, it's going to be hopefully a lot less stressful than Walmart. And uh, 10 years of Walmart. <laughs> Damn. Mm, yeah. It's It's been, uh, I mean, not to get like too personal, but like, you know, 10, ten years, 10 years too long. I really should have left. I should have really should have left in 2015, but uh, I'm gonna leave. Poor there. feet. Yeah, my feet. Yeah, my feet are my feet are trashed, dude. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I could go into it, but you know, this they'll yeah. it'll turn the TMI real real freaking quick. Yeah. Uh, but as for that, um, I'm going. Uh, I'm currently uh, preparing for this door. Uh, for this dork, uh, Kevin, to come up to my house, and we're going to be. Uh, I'm currently uh, preparing for that, so that's going to be fun. He's going to be coming to my house. We're going to be doing quite a few things this time around, and this time we're going to Kings Island. Should be fun. Yeah, I don't really, oh. I don't really go to like amusement parks like 
very often, if ever. The last time I mm-hmm. went to an amusement park, I was like in middle school. So that gives you an idea of how long it's actually been. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and you know, in between, you know, the day that we go to Kings Island and like the other days. Uh, for the other days, you and me are going to go into your theater room and we're going to watch movies. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we're going to be uh, watching a lot of movies. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, Monica Rebellion. And uh, what was the other movie we wanted no, to no, watch? No, uh, I wanted to watch I wanted to watch Promare. Oh, Promare. Yeah, he's yeah. never seen Promare, which uh, that's, something that, that's something that's going to tie into uh, the second segment that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Promare is definitely one of my favorite movies of the 2010s uh, hands down it's actually on hbo max now i noticed it is oh, really it is but yeah. i, I want to watch it at, at, at this guy's place because he's got well, of course an of amazing course. theater system home theater system <laughs> yeah it has a it has a bombing soundtrack and a really good design so a really good sound design so yeah it merits that system it merits that system faux show understandable I only know about King's Island because I've watched many videos about the various horrific accidents that have happened there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let that scare you, Kevin. These were a long time ago. Yeah, 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 most of those were like in the fucking 40s or some shit. No, King's Island opened in the 70s. Right, yeah. I See, I was oh. confused because the photos were in black and white. <laughs> but they were probably just from like newspapers. That's typically what happens, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's newspapers. When are they going to be in color? It's fucking. It's the 21st century. I think oh, they'll be. I think they're already in color, aren't they? Some of some of them. I think only the Sunday editions. At least that's how it worked in my local newspaper. That is weird. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. No What's wonder, so special about Sunday. No wonder. No wonder nobody uses the newspaper anymore. <laughs> yeah. Ever since Scott the Waz stopped uploading exclusively on Sunday, Sundays haven't been special at all. <laughs> It was like a religious experience. Why did you have to do that to us, Scott? Why? I forget. I forget who it was, but somebody on our server uh, t- um, told us that uh, we act all religious whenever Scott drops a new video at the same time every week. <laughs> <laughs> I forget who. It might have been Jen. I don't remember. Um, Oops, somebody Sama, told us Sama, that. Sama. Sama. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sama. Somebody told us that. Um, we act religious when Scott drops, but now he just drops at any time of the week. No, so. I, th- I think that was actually Meowth. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. But like, yeah, 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 can you right, blame yeah. us? <laughs> I guess not. I guess not. All right. <laughs> I love I love being told about things I already know by a guy six years younger than me? no five. <laughs> I forget. Somewhere around there, yeah. Look, it's fun. Okay, it's fun. I like his, I like his passion. Yes, he yes. Al- he also makes the funny haha. <laughs> that's true. That's true. He's also very funny. You're listening to the Scott the Waz Appreciation Fan Cast. <laughs> we could Saul do that. Hale, Scott the Waz. We, we could. could do that. We could. Waz cast. Waz cast. <laughs> Somebody's gonna pop in and be like, "I thought this was about Steve Wozniak. You guys are fucking hacks." Uh, like, it's, it's it's about a Wozniak. <laughs> There is another. There is another. It's like there's one Wozniak because there's only one Wozniak ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's the like, one Steve limit, but here it's the one Wozniak rule. <laughs> yeah. So that 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 what you've been up to lately, uh, the cubes? Uh. Um, as for other things, uh, I got Yakuza Zero. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't really uh, played too much of that yet, so I'm planning on diving into the uh, Yakuza games. And also, I've been meaning to kind of d- dive into Danganronpa real soon too. Uh, I'm going to be mm-hmm. uh, getting that as soon as the uh, that 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 collection comes out. That Danganronpa collection. Uh, Z. Yes. Since I have you, do I need to play? Ultra Despair Girls as well to understand like any of like Danganronpa two or three or anything like that. Um, not to understand two, but um, uh, to understand it's important for uh, Dr three the anime, and it would. I I would definitely recommend it before three and V three. Uh, if it is it strictly strictly necessary, 
Mm, no, but I'd recommend it. Okay, all right, that's fair because that's. I'm just trying to figure because I want to get you know the complete experience, and I just want to yeah, make yeah. Sure, like I don't want to like I want to make sure I don't have to play every single game in the you know in the mythos to like understand. Yeah, no, yeah, kind of thing. Right, yeah the 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 core thing is one. Yeah, the core thing is one, two, uh, another episode, three, and then V3, yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, it's not as complicated as think, a lot of people like to am make I cutting it in? sound. No, you're fine. Kevin, am I cutting you out? You're, you're fine enough. I think I'm cutting out. Not much. Nah, you... I mean, you kind of lagged in the beginning, but you're fine, but yeah. Sorry about that, I cut out. Um, but yes, uh, the, 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 the core order is basically just one to another episode, uh, the DR3 anime and then V3. Okay. All right. That makes yeah. total sense. Yeah. You don't yeah. need a, you don't, you don't need a two hour timeline explained video. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's nowhere near as complicated as what other people like try to make it seem. Danganronpa is not the that complicated no, I, it wasn't that complicated i just wanted to make sure you know from someone that's that's really really passionate about this series i want to make sure i get you know like someone that's a that's already in the know that kind of thing oh yeah, yeah. Oh. if you want passionate you, you got the right guy over here <laughs> yeah someone that that no that knows what the hell they're talking about um i gotta tell you this <laughs> So uh, when uh, Kevin and I were talking about this uh, off camera, uh, I accidentally called Ultra Despair Girls Trigger Happy Girls. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, be oh, fair. I have a total weird Mandela moment. moment. Yeah. Yeah. It, was like a weird, it was like a weird dementia kind of moment. I was like, wait, what? To be fair, that's a sick ass band name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're not wrong. Nope. It's, it sounds like the sister band to Baby Metal. <laughs> mm. I mean, not wrong. <laughs> you know, you know the Tiny Tina's Wonderlands trailer was the best yes. use of Baby Metal I've seen in a while? Baby Metal came on, I'm like, I'm sold immediately. It was I so know the good. game's probably not going to have any ba the game's probably not going to have any Baby Metal in it, but I'm sold already. <laughs> it, like, it Just because it was so good. It fits Tiny Tina so perfectly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You never think about it beforehand, but as soon as it pl started playing, I'm like, you know what? This is perfect, actually. <laughs> this actually works. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> other than that, yeah, other than preparing for Kev, uh, yeah, basically, that's basically uh, about it. Um, another thing mm -hmm. we're going to do while Kevin's here, besides King's Island, uh, we're also going to go to round one again, do... And just do a lot of cool arcade stuff, you know, with Kevin and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, that's pretty much going to be a thing whenever I go up there now is like, oh, hey, Kevin's here. Arcade time. Go. <laughs> yeah. If you leave and come back in the same day, is it round two? Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Get into rules judge on that one. I, I don't know. <laughs> I want to get back to <laughs> round two. Uh I want to get back to my pet peeve, which is I've, I've ran into to Kevin about this before, but I fucking hate timeline videos for things that don't fucking need timeline videos. Yeah. Uh, such as Danganronpa in this instance. Yeah, that one fucking timeline explained video that keeps by, uh, I think, Eruption Fang? I forget. But it keeps getting recommended to me. And I'm like, no, YouTube. Bad YouTube. Nobody, I don't need this. Nobody, I mean, I especially don't need this, but nobody needs this. <laughs> thunk, thunk, thunk. <laughs> Release order. Easy. <laughs> it's like Monogatari. Release order. There we go. But what if I don't want to start at the first game? Then don't. <laughs> I think I've used this, this comparison a million times, but it's like um in goblet of fire where jk rowling realized if you start up book four you're a fucking idiot and you don't deserve the chapter long recap <laughs> <laughs> so she just stopped writing it Good. yeah yep. because that, if you're goblet of fire you're probably already sold on the first yeah. three you're, you're probably already yeah. sold anyway by that point in her career she had enough clout where she could just tell her editor you know what fuck them if they pick up book book four of a series they deserve to be confused 
Basically, yeah. Like, you're mm. doing nobody any favors by doing those, like, mm -hmm. recaps or whatever. If yeah. people want to start... If people want to get into a franchise, they'll start at where it's convenient, and that's typically yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. The, um... We live in a society of stupid monkeys, Kevin. Where um, there's people out there who treat game cases like they're candy wrappers and just throw them away. And I don't understand them. God, that just reminds me of <laughs> you reminded me of a Scott the Waz video where he was talking about game packaging and like used mm -hmm. game packaging in particular yes. and how it's like some of the some of the cases are just like completely torn up like there was an excited kid during Christmas and he just started taking off the wrapper and then he took off the shrink wrap and then he started tearing into the game case itself. <laughs> Yeah, I was there for that sermon, actually. <laughs> sermon? Sermon. God damn it. <laughs> Religious ex experience, people. Mm, the cult of Waz. We're calling it that. Yep. We're calling it that now, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> mm -hmm. We can call ourselves Wa Wozniakians. Okay, we're no. Just Wozniaks. Wa Wa Wozians? Wozniaks? Scotch. Scotch. The Scotch. We can be the Scotch. The Scotch. We'll work the Scott it. The, the Scottish. We can be the Scottish. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's taken. <laughs> Not by anyone worthy. <laughs> but, yeah. I think that'll do it for the first segment, Kevin. What about you? Do you think so? Do you, you agree with me? I... Fellow Scott. Scott. Yeah, Scott. I agree with you. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, you you yeah. agree, too? You agree, too? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Welcome right, well. to the agreeing show. Everyone just agrees here all the time. <laughs> oh man, can't wait for that to be proven wrong in the next segment. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> oh yeah, this is going to be interesting, boys. Mm -hmm. Fun times. All right, stay tuned. Hey, welcome back to the Bucket Gaijin Show with those three fucks you know. Haha, -ha, we've upgraded. Mm hmm. Plus one. It's me. I'm fuck. No. <laughs> hey, I'm fuck. I'm not so fuck. We are the game fucks. <laughs> so, Zeke. Yes. Buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I do the honors of introducing this particular segment? Okay. You know, considering this was entirely my fucking idea. <laughs> that is entirely true. So, uh, this past week saw the release of Star Wars Visions, which is an anime anthology based in the Star Wars franchise. Totally unique for this franchise, by the way. Mm hmm And because I like Star Wars and I like anime, obviously, this naturally appeals to me. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. Mm. Yeah, it's like me. I love vanilla pudding and sardines. So why not together? And there's a couple of reasons why not together. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, I first learned about this about a few months ago. It was announced actually back in 2020, but I didn't realize that this was like an actual thing until yeah. a few months back. Uh, this year in 2021 when there was that first look video that went over like all the directors, all the studios um, and just like what each of the shorts was going to be like focused on um, and yeah I've been looking forward to it since then the interesting thing is ever since The Last Jedi which uh, as we've mentioned before I don't like <laughs> Mm -hmm. Ever since yeah. the last, ever since the last Jedi, my 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 interest in Star Wars has been kind of, you know, it has fallen dramatically. Like I've just kind of been in this wallowing pit of, oh, I'll get around to it eventually. With like every new Star Wars thing that comes out, the Mandalorian, that pit of, that pit of Gundarks. <laughs> funny, funny, mm -hmm. Sar Arlax. 
Oh, uh, that's true. <laughs> that, that's true. Gundark, Dung, Gundark's at a nest. It was a nest yeah. of Gundarks. Yeah. yeah. It's like a Sarlacc pit of despair. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just like, I'll get around to it eventually with, you know, like, the Bad Batch, the Mandalorian, Star, uh, Clone Wars final season. Um, Star Wars Visions, uh, without, you know, spoiling too much as we're going to go into each individual short going forward, uh, yeah. I loved this project, and this yeah. has actually helped to reignite my interest in Star Wars, and I've been watching the movies lately. Um, I actually started up on the original trilogy a couple days ago, and I'm planning on going through The Mandalorian afterwards, uh, I'm going to finish up Clone Wars, I'm going to watch The Bad Batch. Okay. I'm back into it, and I honestly have Star Wars Visions to thank for that. I'm really happy with how Star Wars Visions turned out. There's a couple of shorts that I'm a little, you know, iffy on, but broadly, I really liked it. Um, mm, what about you, Where Zeke? were you when anime saved Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. So, well, Zeke. Yeah? Where were you? <laughs> uh, I gave it a six on Mal. Ooh. <laughs> well. We're going to have words. I guess okay. we will. It's like them's fighting herds, but it's actually words. To be fair, there are a couple of shorts here that, like, I've got mixed fucking opinions on, and one that I just, like, straight up don't like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, I have some I have some opinions myself. Yeah. All right. Well, that, I, mean, I, um, I, I just want to say that, you know, anthologies by their very nature are often a grab bag, um, and I have I have a lot of I have a lot of um, ideas about what makes anthologies good or bad. Uh, I did write that um, that three part anthology of errors blog series for the uh, Danganronpa V three anthology manga. True, where I went into a bit of my um, ideas about that, and some of that might apply here as well. All right, in no sense. Well, but you want to you want to go through them all. One by one, I wrote notes. I got notes. Yeah, uh, I think the best way to go through it is episode by episode because they're each an individual yeah. story. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, I didn't really get to see uh, my perspective on Star Wars. Right. I... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go, so, ahead. go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I forgot you were here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. We haven't joking. had a guest in a while. <laughs> it's joking. been a while. Anyway. Yep. Um. Okay. So. Kevin, I'm kind of in the same boat when it comes to Star Wars. Um, it's like outside of Mandalorian, I have not liked what you know, I have not liked any of Disney's efforts outside of when I saw Force Awakens for the first time. I thought, OK, hmm, maybe Disney can take this in a in a in a good direction. And then, of course, uh, Last Jedi kind of took a flaming piece of shit all over that yeah remember when we thought that jj abrams had a plan <laughs> wow we were such dumbasses man that didn't age fair, well to be fair society thought jj abrams had a plan and then he went on stage and was like actually my writing process involves not having a plan ever and i'm like huh hmm hmm Here's the thing about the mystery box dude <laughs> you gotta have you gotta have the answers to the questions, dumbass. Yep. It's like if somebody made a Rubik's Cube and they're just like, let's just stick the colors wherever and hope it's solvable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta have, it's like the, the magician knows how the trick is performed. Yeah. But for the audience, yeah, you don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I digress. But yeah, but yeah, outside of Disney's efforts with this uh, franchise, I've only liked really uh, the Mandalorian and Star Wars Dolby Visions, as I'm calling it. <laughs> Dolby Visions. <laughs> yeah, because uh, for the video geeks out there, uh, this thing is presented in Dolby Vision. So if you have a really nice uh, OLED screen like me, uh, you're gonna love. You're, you're definitely gonna get some really nice eye candy out of this. So uh, yeah, but all bullshitting aside. Let's get right to it. All right. Yeah. So the first, uh, hold up. I lost my list. Give me a second. Okay. Right. I, have, I, have, I have a list. Okay. So, uh, well, I'll let Zeke start off. Okay. Uh, the first one is the duel. 
Yeah, so... I didn't write down the studio names. If you know the studios, uh, chime in. Yeah, this one was done by Kamikaze Doga, and they're the people who did the opening animations for uh, parts one through three of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Uh, mm -hmm. And both the studio and the director of this short, uh, Takanobu Mizuno, uh, did Batman Ninja for Warner Brothers. Oh. So this isn't their first time taking like a Japanese influence on Western media. Yeah. Um, so I liked the duel pretty well. It's it's pretty good. Yeah, it was a really good way to uh, start start off the show. It really reminded me a lot of uh, Akira Kurosawa's work. Mm -hmm. That's kind of by design. So, uh, yeah, totally. I mean, something that yeah. you guys probably don't know is on top of Star Wars Visions, you know, being released on Disney Plus, Disney Plus also has these uh, filmmaker focused videos going mm -hmm. through the, uh, like each one of the filmmakers and what their thought process was. Um, mm -hmm. And the duel was specifically influenced by both Yojimbo and Seven Samurai. Um, very early uh, Jidai Geki films directed by Kurosawa. And that's definitely noticeable in this movie, in this particular oh, yeah. short. Oh, yeah, it's not a mistake, you know, I know it's, it's, not, it's not like a thing. Yeah, I know it was totally like an inten intentional uh, thing. I'm surprised he didn't take inspiration from Hidden Fortress, you know, as that's uh, the blueprint for A New Hope, but I mean, I'll rest. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a later short. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that one. Um, yeah. So what did you think about the duel, Zeke? Uh, I thought it was very stylistically cool. I really liked how very clear and um, clearly directed it was, despite being black and white and having a lot of sketchy elements. It was very... Uh, there's a lot of clarity. It's very easy to visually follow. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the use of color where it was yeah, used. Too. It's a very, it's a solid adaptation of a simple classic Ronin story in a Star Wars setting. Um, and the umbrella lightsaber is pretty cool. I fucking, creative. I fucking love the umbrella lightsaber. So, um, Same. another interesting part about like influences in this particular one, in terms of Star Wars, um, there's actually quite a bit of influence from the prequel trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, probably the most notable is the fight between the Ronin and the Sith uh, yeah. on the Waterfall, which is heavily referenced from uh, Obi-Wan versus Anakin in Revenge of the Sith. Yep. And... Oh, I never caught that. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. I liked how there was something behind the Waterfall. The gamer in me was happy about that. That scene actually was taken from a scene in Phantom Menace, where like the shields go up during the Darth Maul yeah. fight, and Darth mm -hmm. Maul just impatiently slashes at one of the shields. Uh, the Sith see, actually slashes at the waterfall impatiently in this one, which mm -hmm. is like a direct see, reference. See, see, I like those kinds of references. What I don't like is when people just shout, "Oh, you've got, you've got a bad feeling about this." That shows up like five times throughout these shorts. Yeah, I almost wanted to make a fucking drinking game out of that. Like, mm -hmm. you kind of say, "I have a bad feeling about this. I sense a disturbance." In the fours, take a shot. Mm -hmm. Some of these are written like meme shit posts. A couple of them. <laughs> but like yeah. subtle, subtle references, like the waterfall thing. That's I really appreciate that. Yeah, like I like I didn't recognize it the first time, but when I was watching the filmmaker focus and the director mentioned that, I'm like, shit, that's really clever, actually. <laughs> like uh, it's also a, my notes. It's a very on. small thing. Uh, what about yeah, what? Yeah. Uh, also, in my notes, I had I had written down. I like how the guard captain was smart. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing that's interesting about this one is the Ronin himself being mm -hmm. a Sith. Mm, yep. Like we're not used to Sith being like any kind of benevolent ever. Yeah. So like he 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 went from a he went from a Sith hunter to a Sith hunter. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. Wordplay. Yeah, like there's an interesting amount of there. There's an interesting question, like a lot of interesting questions you could infer from that. Just like, why is he, you know, doing this wandering samurai bit when, yeah. you know, help, I like the, helping people, being a Sith. I, I, I like I like the um the ambiguity of it. I like that it's not like. It's not like he did. It's not like it's implied he did like a 180 and he's like a Jedi now. It's like he's just he's just kind of against the Sith. 
Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of, it's like, yeah, this is not my thing, but I'm not enjoying, yeah. he's, because, he's not on any side, that because kind of. The, because those ideologies are so opposite that I feel like if you were a Sith once, I don't feel like you'd become a Jedi. I feel like you might just stop being a Sith, but not necessarily completely uh, flip, flip 180. I mean, isn't there like also a thing called like, you know, like like a gray kind of thing, like as far as like force balance is concerned, like is it like a gray Jedi or something like that? I mean, I'm kind of mixed, but I, I'm just half remembering like, you know, there was like also a, a gray thing. I think, I think there, I mean, there are, but I don't know if there's a term for that. Kevin, do you know if there's a term for that? No idea, but that does bring up an interesting point in that, like, it do that does kind of explain why he would be a Ronin in this kind of a situation because uh Ronin wandering samurai in yeah. the you know back during you know feudal an feudal and ancient Japanese times they didn't you know again they didn't have a master they didn't you know then serve the shogunate yeah they didn't serve the shogunate they weren't with the government and they didn't really work for the people they kind of worked for themselves and kind of just yeah. went around kind of doing what they want Mercenaries, yeah. yeah. Doing everything yeah, for Bill, pay. As, as Bill Wirtz once said, everybody was hiring samurai. Note only rich and poor and people hired samurai. Normal people without money did not hire samurai. Yeah. Hire a samurai. <laughs> but yeah, that that is an interesting little uh, cultural note about that that I didn't really notice until we were talking about it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't either, if I'm being if I'm being real with you. Yeah. God, that is interesting. Uh, yeah, so I did like this one. Yeah, the duel is good. The duel is really good. <laughs> Good um, uh, my thoughts on the my thoughts on the duel is like yeah I also as far I want to touch on the style for a little bit okay one of my favorite uh, stylistic bits in like film and I've and I've liked this ever since I saw Pleasantville as a kid um, is you know I like spark I like little dashes of color in a uh, grayscale environment that's always been kind of my favorite thing yeah i call that the mad world for the wii effect <laughs> mad world for the wii effect yeah because the only thing that was colored in that was the blood <laughs> yeah 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 but i've always called it like you know for me i called it the pleasantville effect yeah, yeah. Uh, it, admittedly that actually it's old. you mentioned that the action in the duel was very clear and easy to follow and i feel like the color helps to yes define that really well because the yeah, where else are your eyes gonna go <laughs> yeah the lightsabers and like the lasers are really easy to follow so you know what's coming from where and you know yeah. what's going well, on even the yeah but even the black and white elements were very easy to follow you know the positioning and whatnot yeah the artistry in the duel is really good i love the style yeah, for this particular really, show. I, I, yeah. with a it sketchy is, style like a it, it can be pattern. yeah sorry no you're good <laughs> no he can talk it's fine yeah, it is kind of it is kind of like that. You you're you're not wrong about like when you when you put put when you put that kind of style into effect, it is almost kind of like a, a Mad World thing going on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, but yeah, that and also I kind of appreciated uh, the film grain. You know, and this is something I'm going to touch on for like all the shorts. I loved in some of the shorts the use of film grain and it doesn't yeah. look fake or anything like that it doesn't it actually looks authentic like it was almost shot on 35 yeah uh i like when anime does that uh mashoku uh, mashoku tensei does that and i love it that's a good one um so yeah um the duel everyone seems to be in agreement that it was this was this one was pretty good yep that's good good start it's good start uh so the next one going on is Tatooine Rhapsody from Studio Colorido. Uh, Studio mm -hmm. Colorido, they are an offshoot of Twin Engine, and mm -hmm. they're mostly known for uh, uh, Pokemon Twilight Wings and Poketoon. Mm, I've seen neither. Yeah, those are like internet yeah, I'm not a Pokemon guy, so... <laughs> yeah, those are internet anime shorts. Um, so yeah. this is, you know, another internet anime short. <laughs> Basically. It's just kind of the thing that they normally do. Um, this one, I've got some kind of mixed opinions on. I kind of liked it overall. I thought it was enjoyable. It's fine. But there's a, yeah. there, there's a distinct stylistic disconnect of having this, like, rock opera, you know, mm -hmm. 
you know, aspiring band story happen in fucking Star Wars. Yeah, I wrote that down. I said song was okay, but not very Star Wars. It yeah, wasn't. that was yeah. like it didn't really feel like that I mean, if it was like called something else like as a sci-fi thing it probably would have been okay if you just removed the star wars window dressing I, I wrote my top note was this short seems like it came from someone noticing lightsabers look a lot like stage mics <laughs> <laughs> yeah jay the the padawan that you know becomes a friggin front which, man which, which which is another one of my little issues is like did he really have to be a jedi did that really add anything to this? Yeah, yeah. I don't really know why he's why he's a like a fallen that's Jedi not, here. And let me let me tell you, something, that's not the first time I'm gonna ask this question, yeah. but this might be the most pertinent time where I'm like, I feel like that added nothing to this short. Yeah, the only thing you really get is like a little visual thing where he turns his lightsaber into a microphone. Because like I said, I feel like that's the impetus of the whole short. Because he has, you know, a broken lightsaber. Because it's like, well, I'm I'm a front man for a band. Might as well do something with this. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's it's interesting, uh, Cube, that you mention how like this could have worked as like something that's not Star Wars, which is interesting because this is the only story in all of Star Wars Visions that has pre-existing characters in it. Yeah, yeah. Like, smooth yeah, job, because smooth it's like, Jabba is uncanny, uh, I will say that. Smooth Jabba. <laughs> smooth Jabba. Oh, I didn't... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Smooth Jabba. <laughs> One thing I will say about Guy, the the uh, the bassist... He was, he's the bassist in the band, I believe. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting that Guy is the only example I've seen of a hut who isn't abhorrently ugly. <laughs> A lot of that is just art style dissonance, I'd imagine. Yeah, like he, he's he's got kind of this ugly, cute thing going on. He's he's kind of like a pug. Yeah, well, they because well, they want him to be likable, and Jabba's not likable, even when he's not as lumpy as he should be. Yeah, which really bothered me. Jabba needs to be lumpy. <laughs> I didn't dislike Tatooine Rhapsody, but the stylistic disconnect of this kind of story and having this kind of music, this entire thing happening within the world of Star Wars, just doesn't really jive with me. I mean, I appreciate being different and I appreciate the unique elements of it, but I didn't yeah. really feel a strong connection to this particular short. It's fine, yeah. but like, yeah. it's 6 out of 10 fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I There's one detail I want to bring up, though, and it ties into my thoughts about anthologies, which is that I like when anthologies show you a piece of the world you wouldn't have seen from a main story and imply a livelihood and a detail that you wouldn't, you know, that implies more that you will never see. And one thing I like is the detail that the robot has a noticeable leg that's like from a different robot. It's like a different color or model or whatever. And I like I like that kind of detailing because it shows that these characters have a life. We're just seeing a glimpse of their life. And you know, you're never going to know why does she have a different leg, you know? I, no I didn't notice that, like, but now that you think of it, yeah, she did have a different looking leg, huh? Yeah, it's little details like that, I think, really make anthologies work, where it feels like a believable, out-of-context slice of just someone's life in a universe. Yeah, it feels like there is some level of history with some of these characters that we're not seeing, and that's kind of the benefit of, a, of an anthology, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah. The, you do mention that, and I'll get to that that whole you know slight piece out of a character's life thing in a later short because I think there's yeah. a later short that does that really really well. Yeah. Um, um, also, the Boba Fett impression was pretty good. That wasn't an impression. That was actually Tamara Morrison. <laughs> wow, that was actually him. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's doing an impression of himself, so it was a good impression. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yep. Fair enough. I'm not gonna let. I'm not gonna let you be right. <laughs> I have to fight for it. <laughs> All right. I guess. Yep, yep. I feel I feel like Tatooine Rhapsody is probably going to be the one we have the least amount to say on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's talk yeah. about the twins. Oh yes. boy. And oh boy. So I'm going to Studio Trigger, everyone's favorite. You. I mean, yeah. they got they got they got they had, they had to have been, been the best one, right? They're the internet's favorite. I'm going to be totally realistic with you, and this is partially spoiling a later short as well. Mm -hmm. My two least favorite shorts are the ones from Trigger. Shocking! 
Shocking twist! Now, the twins isn't the worst one. The twins is not the worst one. I do like a lot of things about the twins, in theory. Yeah, I like same, same, yeah. Let me, let me tell you about the twins. If you muted this short, I would love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once they start talking, just in the trash can. Oh, God. This, this short has... Oh God! I can't believe it. Okay, let's start with let's start with the positives. It's really it's really pretty. It's really well animated. The action choreography is fantastic. I love the lightsaber yeah. battle between Am and Kare. That is a mm -hmm. lot of fun. And yeah. I will. And honestly, as dumb as the execution for it actually was, this did a better holdo maneuver than Last Jedi. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yup. It totally did. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Hiroyuki Imaishi. Um, yeah. If you like Imaishi, this is this is a must-see visually, at least alone. Oh yeah. But once you start but... getting once you start getting into story, characters, and just consistency with the rest of the lore, here's my problem. Can I? Okay. Here's okay. my problem. Okay. The reason why I like stuff like Kill a Kill and Gurren Lagann is because. Okay, so the reason why I like Gurren Lagann is because, yes, it's outrageous and bonkers and ridiculous, but, but it makes a point of trying to make everything about its world make sense internally. It has yes. internal consistency. Mm -hmm. The reason why I like Kill a Kill is because it makes itself clear very early on that themes, ideas, and strong characterization are more important than, you know, pure logic, and a lot of Kill a Kill just runs on pure batshit coolness. It's a romanticist work, as a literary critic might say. Yeah. My problem with the twins is... Imaishi is trying to do the Kill a Kill thing in a universe that has very strict rules and ideas in place. It's not, it's not just that, though. It's that he's not doing it well. He's not. Let, let, can, I, can I take the reins on this for a sec? Have at it. Yeah, go so, for it. So, I think the thing that I... Okay, I gotta explain all this again because I disconnected. Let's go. <laughs> so, my problem with the twins, immediately from the gate, what annoys me is that they dump the premise on you with a big as-you-know exposition. Yeah. yeah. Which... Which is when you explain the, the premise or the plot to a character that already knows everything and there's no reason for this conversation to be happening. That was the, that was the first warning. I was like, oh, this might be poopy. <laughs> and then the rest of it is such... is This has the highest density. Some other shorts have this problem too, but this has the highest density of meme writing where you have lines like, where are you going? To a, to galaxy, a galaxy far, far, far away. away. <laughs> You know, it has these, so you have a bad feeling about this, there is no try, only do, etc., etc. Like, just forcing them into this context that makes it feel like a pastiche of Star Wars more than something genuine from the universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you get to, I, I, I wrote down, almost feels like a parody, but it's too straightforward to be a parody. And then you get to the actual logical problems, like... How the fuck is he breathing in space? How the fuck and are either he... of them breathing in space? How are they... no no? How are they? Am breathing in loses space? her also... helmet. <laughs> and then why did the robot have a helmet? What the <laughs> fuck? That is a little weird. Okay, I'll give you guys that. I mean, like, I just enjoyed it more from a stylistic turn off your brain kind of thing. Which is fine, but like when you really start getting into like how this works within Star Wars, it doesn't. <laughs> also, lore-wise, we're gonna bring, probably going to bring this up a few times, but I don't think they know what a kyber crystal is. Yeah, like, kyber crystals <laughs> admittedly are a source of power, but it's almost entirely to power lightsabers, and I'm not sure how a kyber crystal is supposed to power a, a, a planet-destroying thing. Like, that's never really been a thing before, I don't think. <laughs> Zeke, as you said on Twitter, I believe in one of your notes you said, Kyber crystals are not mood rings. I think that's a later that's short. For, yeah, that's for a later short, but nice foreshadowing. Yeah. Also, the also the voice acting in this is kind of still... I love NPH, 
He was my he was my high school crush. Yeah, Neil Patrick Harris. But I, don't, plays I think Kai. I think he I think he was miscast here. I think the voice acting is weirdly stilted in this one. Yeah, it's Al- been a while. Yeah, Allison mm-hmm. Allison Bree does a good job for about eighty percent of this, but when she really has to ham it up, it just seems it just feels weird. Mm-hmm. And it well, I'm a nerd, like, so I'm not, I'm not allowed to admit Allison Brie does anything well. And it, and it sounds like her voice just kind of cracks at a couple of points, and it's like, mm-hmm. eh. And Neil Patrick Harris, his line reads were all over the place, and I don't know why. Yeah. That, that I don't care me, about any one of them! <laughs> that that that, re- that reeks to me of, of we only had him for the afternoon. Yeah. This was the, this was the short that had the roughest dub, I think. Like mm-hmm. all the other shorts, I can like look at the dub and be like, "Yeah, I can see why you cast these characters." And like, yeah, they did a good line read, but like the twins just has really odd direction in line reading, and I have mm-hmm. no clue what the hell happened here. Yeah, because like uh... Allison, because like Allison Brie and Neil Patrick Harris are talented actors, and I don't think they were yeah. cast well here. <laughs> You know, Patrick Harris is even a talented voice actor sometimes. I love his, um, he was the music meister in Batman Brave and the Bold, and he was fucking fantastic. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mostly, they cast him mostly for his singing, let's be honest, but even when he wasn't singing, he was still great. And probably some other things I'm, I can't think of right now, but I know he's done other voice work. Yeah, and that's ultimately why I dis- I don't, okay, I don't quote-unquote dislike the twins, but I have, I, do. I have the most problems with the twins, because... It's very visually impressive, and it's Imaishi, of course, it's fun, but the second you start to think about any of this, it just falls apart, and he tried to bring the his Kill la Kill style of writing into Star Wars, and it didn't work. It, it yeah. didn't work, and he didn't do it well. I feel like if he went completely balls to the wall and made it a fucking parody, I would have liked it, but it just plays itself too seriously while doing all this stupid shit. It feels weird. What's weird is that, well, what's even weirder is that the writer for this short, um, let me bring up the writer's name. The writer for the short was Hiromi Wakabayashi, and she is actually a writer for most of the comedic uh, episodes of things that uh, Imaishi has directed. She did a lot of work on Panty and Stocking. Uh, she did episode four of Kill la Kill. Um uh. But, like, she's given this very serious and fairly straightforward story yeah. to tell, and I think they got the wrong writer. I don't know, yeah. like, I don't know why they didn't bring Kazuki, Na- Kazuki Nakashima on here. Like, mm-hmm. him and, yeah. like, like him and uh, Imaishi, like, their styles go together like peanut butter and jelly, really. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know what the hell was going on where, like, they picked this writer who's typically best known for their comedy and tried to get them to do a serious story, and it just didn't work. Yeah. This is, uh, I I dislike the twins, and it's not even my least favorite. (laughs) It's not. Ugh, jeez. I'll get to my least favorite soon, but before Um, that... What? I kind of... My thing with that is, it's like... With your, with your reaction to it, I am a little afraid how you might react to Promare. I mean, Promare, I feel like, might be better, in my opinion. Promare doesn't have the problem of having to live up to a previously established universe. It's also a full film. That it helps. Is. Yeah, and it has time to... Ex- yeah, it has its own universe. It makes its own rules, so... No, no, we like Ima- Imaishi style. It's just... Oh, you know, no, it's fine. It's fine. But the, yeah, I do gotta say this. I, I was kind of calling it Space Promare, and I think that's <laughs> why I kind of liked it, because I kept calling it Space Promare. Yeah, so. that's fair. So, moving on. The next one, this is my second favorite. This is my second favorite short, The Village Bride. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. Uh, uh, yeah. the, uh, the Village Bride is directed by Hitoshi Haga and done by Kinema Citrus. Kinema Citrus, of course, does Rising Black of the- Bullet! Black Bullet, Rising of the Shield Hero, <laughs> and Made in Abyss. I believe mm-hmm. Hitoshi Haga is actually the director of Black Bullet. <laughs> yeah. Kill giant bugs. So, yeah, The Village Bride. This is the one... I, I mentioned earlier that you mentioned that the best ways in which... Uh, one of the biggest strengths of, a, of an anthology, you mentioned, Zeke, mm-hmm. is... Yes. Like 
it being like a slice out of somebody else's life. And I feel like the village bride is the one that does that the most strongly. Yeah. Because uh, you get this see. because you get this slice of this yeah. small community um, on this planet that is, you know, up until this point has just been completely, you know, divorced from the war efforts that's been going on. Um, right. Interesting thing to note, this this particular short is one of, I believe, two that take place post Order 66. Right. Um, which, real quick, that's another thing. Um, you could have made the whole thing with Jay and Tatooine Rhapsody make more sense if it was post Order 66, but no, it takes place during the Clone Wars. I don't think it matters too much. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, moving on. I really like The Village Bride. Um, a good part of it is the music. Kevin Pankin's music in this particular yeah. short is fucking phenomenal. I've always, oh, yeah. been, I've, I, yeah. I've always been a fan of Kevin Pankin's music ever since I saw Made in Abyss, and his work here is really no exception. It stands out like among all the music in the rest of the shorts. Um, uh, there was one I liked that had better music, I think. We'll talk about that one soon. Um, How do you know what one it is? I'm guessing, but... <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, we'll see if you're right. But I really like The Village Bride. Um, it's very atmospheric. I love this kind of ethereal element to it. Another One thing I really like about it is how, even though these people are otherwise divorced from the whole thing about, like, the war jedi sith mm -hmm. and whatever they still have this connection to the force and they still have their way of interacting with it and you know th how that like influences their society as a village i love that element of this particular short um curious to know what you thought about this particular short zeke it's eh, it's eh. Mm -hmm. um i think it has it has good music. It it looks nice enough. I think my thing, and it does it does do the slice of life thing uh, pretty well. I I think the duel does it a bit better, but this is all right. Fair enough. enough. Um, but also, it's. I have a few I have a few major things against it. One is that I think it's too divorced from Star Wars. If you, I wrote down. If the bandits didn't reprogram separatist droids, it would not look like Star Wars. All right, fair enough. There's almost no like actual Star Wars iconography here, and I, I don't need that shoved in my. Who told me this was any other anime? If it wasn't for that one element, um, it's also another sort of another Ronin story. Whereas I felt like the duel did that so well, we didn't need another one. Mm. Um, fair enough. Was... That was another. That was another thing I laid out in my anthology blogs, which is that when you don't have any communication between the different parties, you get overlap like this. Yeah, that's need to fair. Be. And it just makes them. Need, it just makes them compete with each other when they shouldn't have had to in the first place. So I, I'll, I really feel like anthology projects need to have at least some oversight where they're like, let's not step on each other's toes too much. Yeah. That said, I do think that the Village Bride has something unique apart from the duel, in that with the duel. The focus. Color. <laughs> well, the duel was more so focused on the Ronin himself and like yes. being a very yeah. action adventure, uh, you know, samurai epic. Whereas the Village Bride has more so uh, the Jedi character who is only given as F in the script. Um, mm -hmm. The character of F is really only a bystander and only gets involved at the very end when she realizes. See, that's my that... least. That's that's my least favorite kind of Ronin story, though. <laughs> the one where the Ronin is barely in it and doesn't matter. That's fair enough. I mean, yeah. But I really also, liked. I, also, 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 I thought the ending was pretty abrupt. Ever so slightly. It just, it just kind of stops. Oh um, man, there, there's a short afterwards that has that even yeah, more. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I'm just saying this one and this one had it first. Where I, it just, it just kind of stops and there's no like, there's no like quick follow through or wrap up or anything. It's just like, mm, nope, there it is. Well, that's your I opinion. Kinda... What's your opinion? <laughs> okay, the only thing I need to, I have an act, I have a, an axe to grime with this short is, I hated how digital it looked. It looked it looked a touch too digital for me for some reason. Like it looked like, you know, that stereotypical flash thing, that kind of thing. It looked almost too digital for me, which it, it looked, that, it, it, looked that was, 
it looked kind of like a, an HD version of an early DigiPaint show. <laughs> Yeah, or uh, or to or if I want to be kind of mean, that was kind of the reason why I couldn't get into My Little Pony. It, was, ah. it, 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 it looked kind of like that style. Which... Well, is, this all, is this also why you hate Canadian cartoons? <laughs> I mean, we're not gonna get. <laughs> you can say yes. <laughs> I want like it would make sense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess, but like, you know, but like that, that was, I, I didn't even have Canadian animation in my radar. <laughs> when mm. about this. <laughs> but, you know, that that's kind of like that. That was kind of my problem with with this particular short. I mean, it was it was fine otherwise, but something about the way it looked kind of kind of rubbed me the wrong way. That's my that. thing. I don't think it's one of the better lookers. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a little weird stylistically it's, it's, because it has, and it's and it's sad because I I kind of citrus is capable of so much more. I mean, see, made in abyss, see, uh, black bullet, see that you know that kind of thing. Yeah, the biggest issue I have stylistically with the village bride. This is like, I mentioned how much I loved you know the lore elements and how much I loved the music wasn't hot on the visuals and a lot, I think a lot of watching it again watching it again today I noticed that while the short does have a lot of complex character design like you know typical yeah. anime character design the coloring and yeah. is all very flat block shading with not yeah. a whole lot of complexity and it makes everything seem very flat and artificial for lack of a better term yeah that's my issue yeah i feel like you put that a little bit better than me so the post processing on the village bride is its weakest element mm -hmm. and that's my biggest issue with it i liked it otherwise but that's my biggest problem with it is just visually it was kind of a letdown yeah so the next short i'm oh boy where do i start with this one the next short is The Ninth Jedi from Production IG, directed by Kenji Kamiyama, who did Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. Zeke, I want you yeah. to take I want you to take point on this one because I want to know what you thought on this one before I give my thoughts. Okay. Alright. Well, number one, as we alluded to earlier, kyber crystals are not mood rings. <laughs> so <laughs> real quick. Yeah. The, the whole thing about like the, the lightsaber blade being a reflection of the of the user whoever is holding it hmm. isn't a new thing actually is that actually I don't think it is either but it's just I don't like it either way <laughs> yeah it came from an early draft of return of the jedi uh the original version of the scene where Darth Vader holds Luke's lightsaber originally had the blade turning from green to red yeah i never liked that idea uh which is not canon it wasn't in the final version. It's not canon. Fair enough. It wasn't a Marvel never... comic. <laughs> <sighs> well, that's Legends now, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, but I never liked that idea because I think it takes the element of choice out of the equation, and it just kind of makes it so you have a you have a dark personality, so you are Sith now because the the mood the mood ring crystal turned red. <laughs> mood ring crystal. <laughs> I think that's stupid, and I think it's better when it's like a purposeful choice a character actually makes. And plus, it's it's just in 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 um inconsistent with everything else, you know, like all the fucking video games you get to choose your own color and whatnot, where it's like, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense if they're mood rings, you know. <laughs> yeah. But enough about that. That's a minor fucking thing. And to be fair, the twist they pull off with it is pretty cool. It is pretty yeah, cool, like, and we get that was our... my thing about that. And to be fair, yeah. we got our first clear lightsaber. Yes, it looks nice. <laughs> I, I think in live action it would look like shit, but in animation it looks nice. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. But I, I will say uh, this one was uh, so it's okay. Uh, the the uh, the problem I have with it is that this this one more than any other except maybe other maybe one feels more like a backdoor pilot than an anthology piece. That is exactly my problem with this short. <laughs> yeah. This um, this. Like, I, I like the setup, but like 
it you, that's all it is you get set up and then like that's it there's no like story being told it's amusing to me that like half the fucking time in the short is just let's wait for something else to happen let's mm-hmm. wait for that to happen and then by the yeah. time you're done waiting the short's over <laughs> yeah what was uh, your what, what was your opinion on this drew because like me and yeah. Zeke seem to be about on the same page <laughs> Uh, yeah, to be honest, that's the only things I can really remember. I didn't really find it that memorable was because the only thing I remember was kind of like that twist at the end and the fact that, oh, it's it's clear. Yeah, that's the that's literally all I can really remember was that. So I it's like, it's kind of it. Yeah. So it's almost kind of unmemorable for me. I like the the Roka no Yusha t- style setup. But if you want that, you can also go watch Roka, Roka no Yusha. So <laughs> I do also like the kind of way that they play with expectations in this particular short because the Margrave is very Sith-like but he's actually the good guy and Mm -hmm. all of the people that you think are the Jedi are actually Sith and Mm -hmm. again like you said the mood ring kyber crystals end up giving a really cool visual when they all ignite their lightsabers and they're all red (laughs) yeah Uh, I will say production wise uh, it has some some nice designs it was one of the most more cinematic of them I felt Mm-hmm, yeah. um, as you might expect from production IG. There is some awkward CG blending I noticed, particularly when she's on the ice. It was like there's some weird compositing going on Oh yeah, on, there. On, her, on her speeder, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but production wise, I thought it was pretty good. Um, I, did think so. I did like one of the comedic bits with that robot saying I'm taking a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, robot that drinks tea. <laughs> it looked like he was smoking coffee from a pipe. <laughs> Well, he doesn't have lips. <laughs> he does. He shouldn't be able to ingest fluids in the first place. Uh, coffee break. Pipe straws. Whatever the fuck. That was kind of amusing, though. It's just like, I'm on my break. Find someone else. You're the only one who's activated. Get up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, it's... It's nice. It's good for that twist moment. And it's cool. It's nice to look at. It held my attention, but like, there's not a whole lot to say because this one really feels like a backdoor pilot. Yeah, so you're correct. The girls, the girls, the girls, nice and and, and uh, endearing and whatever, but like, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, and the thing is, you're basically bang on because mm-hmm. again, watching the filmmaker focus episode, uh, Kenji yeah. Kamiyama basically outright says uh, it's up to the viewer if they want to see more of this story. Basically, if you want more, watch Visions. Which is just like... That's the wrong mindset to go into an anthology with. It's totally wrong. And another thing, interestingly, is that the Ninth Jedi... So when Star Wars Visions was originally announced, it was announced as ten shorts. And Kenji Kamiyama was allowed to submit two ideas. But both of the ideas he came (laughs) up with, which were uh, the Masterless Jedi story and the story of uh, a lightsaber smith uh, bringing lightsabers to Jedi um Kenji Kamiyama felt that like he was being restricted by keeping those individual ideas as separate and he asked Lucasfilm if he could combine them into a full into into a longer short because the ninth Jedi is the longest short of the bunch at 22 minutes um but like if I'm being real I feel like combining the two ideas ended up making it less than the sum of its parts. Yeah. Because it's it's not, it's not the worst, but like, yeah. Someone on Twitter described it as actively rebelling against its runtime. And I think that's a really good descriptor for the issues with the ninth Jedi. It feels like it is only part of a story and the film and straight up the filmmaker is designing it in a way that you know it leaves off and it can be you know followed up on in a future star wars whatever the hell but like as it stands yeah. as a single as a singular mm-hmm. piece of media yeah it, it is incomplete and i yeah and i think but also, I, I also feel like if you're trying to go the backdoor pilot route, I feel like you need to try a bit harder than this. I don't think anything's going to come from this one. Agreed. It's kind of a mixed bag, this one. Yeah. That said, our, our parts of it that I really did like... Oh, yeah, again, 
um, lightsaber fight was really fun in this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fighting was good. It's good. It's great. All right. One of the best in terms of fighting. So this is one that I really want to know your opinion on. Uh, number six is the first science Sadu short. Uh, T0B1 by Abel Gongora. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on this one, Zeke? It sucks. No. No. <laughs> no. No. I like this one. <laughs> Me too. I actually kind of like this one too. Go I ahead. do not like this one. Oh God. All right. So, yeah. so the first note I wrote was we got sick of doing the lone Ronin thing, so we decided to copy Astro Boy instead. So yeah, that's by design. I know, that's you know the two things Japan is known for: Ronin and Astro Boy. <laughs> That's by design. Uh, Abel Gungora grew up on Astro Boy, and he wanted I to imagine. do, and he wanted to do an homage to Osamu Tezuka's works. He grew up on Astro Boy. What is he like? Eighty? There are like three different versions of Astro Boy. <laughs> okay, I thought you meant like the fifties one, and I'm like, that guy has to be fucking old. Yeah, no, there's like the sixties, the eighties, and the two thousands. He was probably growing up on like the eighties version or something. Yeah, that's but yeah, that's but yeah, um. But yeah, by design, this was meant to be an homage to Osamu Tezuka through the lens of Star Wars. And I personally... That's such a stupid idea. I personally liked it. I thought it was cute. Yeah, I liked it too. Yeah. It was a little trippy, but that thing and that studio, that's uh, Science Saru in general, or Science Monkey. My, my, main problem with this sh my main problem with this short is actually the fact that it feels rushed near the end. It feels rushed the entire fucking time. A little this, bit. This short, this short runs on fast forward, and there's so little to it that I feel like this one had like five minutes of thought put into it. I. Mm. They spent longer. The, the short is longer than I feel like the amount of time they spent thinking about it is. And the, my first warning flag for that was when the professor, the not Dr. Light, he's not Dr. Light, don't say that. He's <laughs> not Dr. Light. Not Dr. Light, <laughs> where, he's, where the guy with the robot's like, I want to be, I want to be a Jedi. And then the doctor's like, enough of your silly dreams. Anyway, follow your silly dreams. Here's the quest and what you need to do it. And I'm like, what the fuck did that? He just switched gears in the same sentence. Yeah. He's, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. That is a little bit weird. That's There's a, no arc there. He's just like, I'm against this. Nope. Never mind. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Go for it. Find a, find a rock. Yeah. Go off, King. <laughs> Go off, King. <laughs> 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 God damn it! Mm -hmm. I did. I did really like T T O B one or fuck it, Toby. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, -O -B -1, I yeah. don't. It's very not Star Wars. He's very, and that's not to say you can't have droids with feelings. Obviously, you can. But like, just his whole aesthetic, his whole fucking thing. Like, it's it's Astro Boy or Mega Man or something. It's not fucking the. It's not the clanker tech I like from Star Wars. You well, know? well, the, the sort of sleek white you know aperture science esque sci-fi is used very sparingly in star wars like the clone facility is like that but that's like supposed to be special yeah. you know that's like the most unusual sort of isolated alien society even by star wars standards yeah so it makes sense that it's visually distinct but like here there's like no reason for it it just doesn't feel like star wars at all yeah but unfortunately i like astro boy and i like mega man <laughs> So this ended yeah, up actually no, appealing that, to me quite a bit. I get that, but I get that, but do you, I get that. But do you want that in Star Wars? It's like we were saying earlier. It's like we like Imaishi style, but do we want Star Wars Imaishi style? Not particularly. Fair enough, but I don't feel like this in particular has the logic problems that the twins does, because at the very least, it's consistent with Star Wars lore. This is the other short, by the way, that I takes just told, place. I just told you why it wasn't. is because okay. the whole fucking aesthetic is wrong. This, For the record, this is the other short that takes place post-Order 66. <laughs> right, yeah. Figured that much. Um, it straight up tells you. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Um, I, just, like, I just feel like the script on this one is just so fucking lazy. With, with the, the, the thing I just mentioned, but then... There's also, we got some meme writing. There's another instance of, I got a bad, you've got a bad feeling about this. I'm one with the yeah, force you know. and the force is with me. <laughs> yeah, he get, yeah, he gets over the fucking professor's death in like a fucking snap in like an instant. 
And also, something I noticed, who the fuck made the grave? That's a good point. Did the Inquisitor do it? <laughs> I feel like, that's what I mean by this short didn't feel like it had any thought put into it, because it's like, well, he's dead, so there's got to be a grave. And the, nobody thought to think, who the fuck would make the grave? It, it's a planet with nobody else on it except the guy who killed him, and then he left. Why would he make a grave? Why was why is there a grave there? Yeah, that's fair. This short yeah. needed more time. I feel like yeah. this short needed a lot more time to actually tell its story than it actually got. Mm -hmm. um, I like what I got, but I feel it could have been a lot more. And, and like, here's the thing. Here's another thing. I didn't do any research before. I, I didn't follow the previews. I didn't watch the trailers. I didn't know anything about visions before i started watching it fair enough you know other than like yeah. some some weird hearsay so here here's my other problem is that when i heard there's one about like a, a, a lone robot or something i'm like okay that's a cool star wars type story but then what i got instead was a robot that doesn't look like anything from star wars and he wants to be a jedi in an anthology that's fucking full of people who either want to be jedis or become like one th problem I have with the overlap in this entire anthology is that there's just so much hyper focus on Jedi, 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 even when there's no reason for it. Yeah. And like, there's other aspects of the Star Wars universe that are fascinating that could be di dive into, especially from the perspective of a droid. But no, it's just a fucking kid that wants to be a Jedi. There's no reason for him to be a droid in that case, even. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is kind of my issue. It's just like, yeah, let's do more than just Jedi. I, that is a fair point. That, I will get That said, it is kind of implied by the ending that uh, Toby is actually uh, recreated from Professor Mitaka's former Padawan. I don't know. I guess. Whatever. I don't know what happened to the former Padawan. Did he die? How did... To, how did Toby how, how did become a, a, a droid or whatever? It That's looks, what I'm yeah. saying. There's no, there's no fucking. There was no thought put into this fucking one. This one sucks. I, I, I feel like it's a bit too harsh to say that was no thought put into it. I feel that it was restricted by its runtime. I, no, I feel like, sure, but I feel like that's kind of an excuse because that's. Basically saying we, they didn't think of a story that they they could meld to that. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's not a yeah. difference to me between saying it's constrained by its runtime and saying, well, they didn't properly think of a story that could fit in that runtime and also made sense in that runtime and made good use of that runtime. Yeah. So what? Basically, by, when you say that, what you're saying is it's poorly written, and the runtime is just one aspect of that. Yeah, I feel like Abel Gungora was probably a bit caught up in his whole idea of Osamu Tezuka meets Star Wars that like. Mm. It, it, yeah, there are elements of it that just don't jive. I still liked it, though. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I liked it, but it's a very heavily flawed short. I will absolutely give I, it that one. I yeah. fucking hate this one. It is probably my least favorite. Maybe. Maybe. It's either my least favorite or my second least favorite. Yeah. So that's TOB1, right? <laughs> Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, I think I think I don't have anything else to say on TOB1. And now we're moving on to my least favorite short of the bunch, The Elder. Oh. Uh this I liked is, it, okay. This is the other I got my reasons for why I don't like this one. Okay. So The Elder is the other trigger short, and this was done by the other uh founder of Trigger, uh Masahiko Otsuka. And man Poor Otsuka. This I is, do like how he, the two trigger shorts are so dynamically opposite. It's cool. Stylistically, this is so different from the twins, because mm -hmm. whereas the twins is just this like weird, bombastic, out there story, um, the elder is a lot more subdued and pensive. Um, yeah. That said, there's some stuff here that I really don't like. Um, I liked it okay. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I want to hear your thoughts on it real quick. Uh, okay, sure. Um, there's a few things I don't like about it, but like, I uh, I, li I like the Elder. I thought it was a good slice uh, slice of the universe. Sto I mean, yes, it's about Jedi and Sith or whatever, and I've already said I'm sick of that. But like, it was it was well done, and it was it's uh, it was his own slice of the. I li I kind of liked how subdued it was. It felt more authentic to the universe of Star Wars to me. Um, Admittedly. And I, I, I like, uh, there's a little bit of, 
No, sorry, that's the wrong. No, uh, I like the dialogue in here. I, I like the the banter between the uh, the Padawan and the Master. Um, it feels pretty natural. It's not the most exciting stuff in the world, but like I wasn't bored or anything. It, it was like, you know, it was engaging enough. That's the th um, that, that's actually something. Yeah. I, that's actually something I had an issue with, because I didn't find either Taijun or Dan very interesting. They're not like unique or interesting, but like they're. I feel I felt like they were humanized enough to the point where I'm like, yeah, these are these are Jedi. These are believable Jedi for the most part. I do Fair have enough. one little issue. Oh, uh, something I wanted to note here, which is that I think the Skywalkers have tainted people's views on Padawans being reckless or craving action. Um, and I that was pretty. It was it was more subtle here in this one with Den or Dan or whatever his name. Dan, was. Dan, yeah, yeah, but. He has that sort of uh, impulse within him, and I feel like that's kind of a misunderstanding because, like, the reason that happens in the movies is because Anakin was taken in when he was, you know, older than he should have been to be inducted into the Jedi Order, and then Luke was a guy in his 20s learning all this stuff, yeah. so, like, obviously they've got, like, their own identities and, you know, impulses and stuff, but, like, a, a Padawan that's been trained from early, early childhood, indoctrinated into the Jedi Order, it sh they shouldn't really have these sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, I feel like that should be very, like, rare and unusual. Because the whole point is to weed that sort of stuff out. So, while I don't hold it against the short too bad, I feel like that's just something I wanted to make note of, where, like, I see that in a lot of other Star Wars media, where, like, Padawans have this, like, inherent recklessness. You know, they try to copy the Obi-Wan-Anakin dynamic, but I'm like, the thing about the Obi-Wan Anakin dynamic was that for a master Padawan relationship, it was weird. And that was the point. Yeah. It was it was supposed to be unusual. Uh, and that's that's part of why things went the way they did. Um, but so yeah, that's one thing I have a little bit against it, but like other like it was it was downplayed enough that I thought it was fine. What about you, Cubes? Uh if I'm being honest, I really <laughs> I don't have all that much to say about this short era then i don't want to say it's it is a little bit mid to me i mean i did like the fight like at the you know towards the end all that stuff as we got to that that climax to that what was that that uh that looked it looked like a wise old man but it turned out to be a sif that was actually pretty neat that was kind of neat ultimate mm -hmm. the elder himself does have a fantastic design i will say that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that was pretty cool and it, it kind of fools you it kind of yeah. puts, puts you into that false sense of security see, yeah see, i didn't i didn't love i didn't actually like the fighting too much because i felt like the fighting was weirdly constrained considering how they're talking agree like the elder the elder will run up and like He'll block like twice, like, ah, oh, you're so powerful. You're the most powerful opponent I've ever faced. And if I faced you in your prime, I would have never won. I'm like, all they did was block twice. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so weirdly okay, constrained. Yeah, I. that's one of my big issues with this short. On top of just, like, not finding Taijin or Dan very interesting, I really did not like the fights. Um... I felt the fights were just way too restricted, very poorly blocked. Um, yeah. It does not... It, it is the short that takes the least advantage of the fact that it's animation. Yes. It is... It, it, it takes the least amount of advantage of the fact that it's an animated product, and yep. it just feels like this very weirdly restrained product that shouldn't be as restrained as it, as it actually is it just feels like this one tone the entire way through which isn't necessarily a bad thing but I like it but like it's hard to really nail like it's it's hard to re for me to really grasp on something that i actually really liked about this short aside from eh, the elder was kind of cool i can think that's, of that's that's true but I have a counterpoint to that which is that i'm barely gonna remember any of these fucking shorts in six months so <laughs> By the standard I'm judging it by, it was fine. And I feel like with a short story like this, um, I almost prefer you stick to a tone because you can dive into it more. Fair right. enough. Well, but I f Otherwise, you get shit like, oh, no, my father figure just died. Well, time to become a Jedi. It's like, fucking, <laughs> you know, you get that fucking shit yeah. when you don't, you know, when you have one tone, you don't have to fucking worry about that because everything's kind of the same sort of palette, I guess. I also, and... This isn't okay. So like, this short only had about fifteen minutes to tell its story, 
And yeah. I was very irritated by the fact that about half the runtime is just spent with Taijin and Dan just talking. I enjoyed that because it felt like a natural, real conversation and not a bunch of memes being spat out at each other. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know. I feel like I would have wanted more action, more of... I also wanted to see more of just, like, this planet that they actually landed on. Well, it sounds we like don't... you're a reckless you're a reckless Padawan and you want too much out of life. <laughs> I, I, I kind of felt like I wanted more of what planet they, they landed on and, like... See, I, I liked that we didn't get to learn too much, though, because I felt like they didn't have time to get into the nitty-gritty of things, so why not just kind of leave it as the ambiguous slice of uh, the universe that it is? Yeah, fair enough. You know, th th this felt like a very authentic sort of uh, mission between a Jedi and his Padawan, and that's kind of what I wanted more out of, of uh, out of the anthology. I'm not saying it was perfectly done or it was the most interesting story ever told. It certainly wasn't, but like this one pissed me off, I think, the least. Oh. Other than the duel, which is good. Hmm. Okay. Well, so. hmm, we're going to have some things to talk about later then. Hmm. Um, in fact, we have things to talk about right now. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I guess I guess we're done with the Elder. Yeah, yeah we're done. Good. Uh, short number eight is Lop and Ocho from Geno Studio, which is another offshoot of Twin Engine. Uh, Geno mm -hmm. Studio is known for doing uh, Jujutsu Kaisen. That was and Mappa. Was Mappa? Nope. Uh, Geno Studio. But Kevin, I Works. saw the Mappa logo. They wouldn't lie to me. Oh, my bad. Golden Kamui. <laughs> it was one of those two. A... Yeah, one of those two very different shows. Shut up. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, yeah, they're most known for Golden Kamui. I corrected yeah. myself. And okay. uh, this is the directorial debut of Yuki uh, of. Uh... Let me get the name right here. Yuki Igarashi, who is an animator for Mob Psycho 100, uh, Welcome to the mm. Ballroom, and uh, of course, Golden Kamui. Um, uh, is the first time AD? Uh, first time directing. Uh, he is an animator, but right. um, this is his first but time for... doing directing, storyboarding, he is character designer, and he tops the key animation list. This was a very personal oh, well... project for him. By that standard, it's actually really impressive. Yeah, that's pretty cool, yeah. So, Lapidocho is my favorite. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Lapidocho was incredibly fun. Also, Benui. I love his worst, pick. his worst picks. I, I fucking loved Lapidocho. This is my favorite short of the bunch, no contest. Yeah, it was fun. I like that one. That was definitely the cream of the crop on that one. Oh, God. I want to know what... Oh, okay, so, what I loved about this short is I loved that this was this takes the element of Star Wars that is based on family and it goes mm -hmm. in an interesting direction with it this is a family that was torn apart by war this takes place between episodes 3 and 4 during the rise of the Empire and mm -hmm. the expansion of the Empire's territories throughout throughout the galaxy Yep. and I love this short because I, I love found family stories. Like that shit just appeals to me in a very personal way, and yeah. and I freaking love Lop's character in this story about how yeah. she was brought into this family who seemed so close and had such a strong connection, but they were torn apart by the war and differing ideals over mm -hmm. what was best for not just the family but for the world in which they lived, and. Mm -hmm the conflict felt so viscerally real compared to all the other shorts in this particular collection. Yeah. And it had a very emotional climax that I just friggin' adored top to bottom in this particular instance. Yeah. And Lop and Ocho have this such a believable conflict because you understand both of where they're both of where both of them co are coming from ocho was basically born into slavery her parents died or implied to have died a very long time ago and she was immediately taken in by the empire as a I slave think you, lop. you said ocho you meant i meant lop. lop i meant lop nay it's yeah. late but yeah lop, <laughs> but yeah lop was you know 
it's implied her parents died a long time ago and she was immediately mm-hmm. brought into slavery by the empire and she was taken out of the out of it by by Ocho herself as a kid yes. so so there's already this tragedy that the person the very person whom Lop had the strongest connection with her own sister basically disowns her near the end saying why are you doing any of this you're not even a part of our family Mm -hmm. and you really feel for Lop's particular position in this short because she wants her family to be together forever she doesn't want to lose anybody but circumstances have forced her into a position where she's basically lost everything and she has to fight to get it back I love this short so goddamn much (laughs) Yeah, uh, it was yeah. it was good stuff. It was definitely the it was definitely one of the crowns of this. Definitely like one of the uh, gold bars in this for sure. You probably have a couple of things to say about this Zosie, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Got some opinions. Um, yeah. Uh, not my favorite. I'd say probably the duel was my favorite still. Yeah, that, um, that's that's like top three for me easily. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, I, yeah. That's that's how you start. That's how you start an anthology right there with a bang. Yeah, yeah. I think Lapanocho is probably my second favorite of the bunch. Yeah. But I also don't think that's saying a whole lot because I didn't really enjoy Visions that much. Um. Yeah, I agree with pretty much uh, pretty much everything you said. Um, I do have some some things uh like uh like you said with the family element but like more more in a star wars a sense i do appreciate the somewhat more somewhat more nuanced uh view on the empire and whatnot um yeah because somewhat. yeah because what ocho is ultimately trying to do here is she's just trying to save her planet yeah and yeah. she's doing that w- through whatever means necessary and because the empire you know, is powerful. She doesn't want to go against these people because she knows she can't win. Or rather, she yeah. feels she can't win. Yeah. So, uh, when, yeah. she kind Even of feels like her hands are tied. Yeah. Even when it's, like, super simple like that, I do like it whenever, like, Star Wars delves into the actual ideals and politics of its worlds a little bit. Um, I do like whenever that happens. It's not, like, super complex here or anything, but, like, for what it is, it's... It's fine, and considering how much bland, good versus evil crap is in the rest of this anthology, it was a bit of a breath of fresh air, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I do. I will say, also, I think this has the best... I feel like this has the best look and animation of the bunch. Absolutely. Yeah. fucking lootly mm-hmm. Yeah. Yuki I think Igar- the ending... Go on. Sorry. Yuki Igarashi is a really good all-rounder animation, a- animator. Yeah. I've looked up his works after having watched Star Wars Visions, and his mm-hmm. strengths are in strong action animation with really clear posing mm-hmm. and very detailed character acting, and both are in full display here. Yes, I think the, the fight at the end is probably the second best fight after the duel. Oh my god, the fight between Lop and Ocho. I was just like, no, please don't stop fighting, but also this fight looks really, really cool. <laughs> yeah, it looks great. Um... That said, uh, I do I do have some issues with it. Number one, again, is while it's not quite as blatant, uh, uh, you know, the problem I brought up before with it's just enough with the fucking lightsabers. Why does everybody need a fucking light? As much as I just praised how cool that fight was, I'm just like, why the f- fuck does she need a lightsaber? It's just like it. It feels like at this point they just think to be important in this universe you need a lightsaber. Yeah, and I, I feel guess. like that's just so fucking restrictive. I know that she's not like unlike others she's not like being introduced to a jedi ideology or whatever anything specific but like it's just another fucking thing where i'm just like enough with the fucking lightsabers that's a minor point but something I'll bring up uh, again. understandable yeah i can yeah. i can understand that particular i, I can kind of understand that particular mm-hmm. stance yeah. but especially the... especially when it, it eats up like four or five minutes of the short to be like this is the blade that's been passed down and we got to explain the history of the of the lightsaber like you don't know what a lightsaber See, is i actually really like that scene because it helped to it's really... a good it's a good scene uh character wise especially yeah but like it also i feel like you could have done that in a better way that didn't involve a fucking lightsaber and it probably would have been an even better scene and more unique also, something I noticed on a second viewing is 
the moment where Ocho fully goes to the dark side is symbolically shown by her taking her blue eyeliner and replacing yes. it with the red of her blood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is just a really, it's a small detail, but on a second viewing, I was like, oh, oh, God. <laughs> yep. Yeah, she immediately goes rogue, yeah. God. It's a good thing her eyeliner wasn't made of kyber crystal dust, it was mood ring eyeliner. <laughs> See, it was a choice she made. It was. It wasn't, it wasn't decided by magic space moon, mood rocks. <laughs> but, um, but that's a good point. That's another reason why I like this particular short. It's all about choice. It's all yeah. about the choices that these people make to what they feel is the most beneficial for their community and what they yeah. feel their community is. Ocho, yeah. is a, Ocho is a servant to her people, yeah. whereas Lop is connected to her family first and foremost. And that diametric opposition forms such a strong core of the conflict in this story. If I'm being real, of all the shorts in this particular collection, Lop and Ocho is the one that I want to see the more of the most. You could, I'll get to that. You could expand Lop and Ocho into a full series. I'll get to that. Because um, one other thing I wanted to say, but first I want to touch on the script. Because I think conceptually it's good and there's a lot of good scenes and good moments, but like one of the problems I have with this one is that the dialogue is very circular where they just keep reiterating the same ideas over and over again of the of the family and you are this to me and I am this to you and we are in conflict now because these ideas no longer fucking mesh and they just re they just reiterate that over and over again and it, like across a whole series it wouldn't be a problem but like in a 20 minute short or whatever it's just it's just bashing you over the head with the premise and I hate when shorts and anthology are just like here is the premise and then later they're just like, remember the premise? This is the premise right now. The premise is happening. And I'm just like, it's just so fucking lazy. Yeah, I didn't mind it that much, actually. It's because you're a scrub lord and also <laughs> wrong. And yeah, then you're gonna give him a W, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and then the um the other thing I wanted to bring up is that if they were to expand this. I will say this. I don't think I would want them to just continue where this left off. I would want them to expand on the stretch of material they have here, because this feels a little condensed. Slightly. Um, this, this feels like the first two acts of a film crammed together, and then they just don't have a third act. It just kind of leaves off. The and so I feel, like, I feel like if you were to expand this, and you could, because I think conceptually it's a really good idea, I would like to see more of their history. I'd like to see how we got to this point. I'd like to see the deeper details of the political divide here. So I feel like if they expand on this, I really hope they don't just make a part two and be like, here's, it comes right after that. I feel like you'd have to like make this sort of like a concept pilot and then just kind of start over from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree pretty much. I did. That was one of the things I did uh, that, because I wouldn't mind this being a TV series, if I'm being honest, that kind of thing. Yeah. Lop and Ocho, yeah, that'd yeah. be fun. Yeah, but not not cutting from directly here, because I feel like then you, you've wasted a lot of your potential. Yeah. yeah, fair. Understandable. Yeah. It would be really interesting to see a more gradual degradation of Lop and Ocho's yeah. relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm getting at. I, I will definitely say this is definitely the better backdoor pilot compared to Ninth Jedi. I'd rather see this than that. Agreed. Uh, I agree completely. And, <laughs> I know I have my my criticisms, but uh, this was still probably my second favorite. It's it's pretty good. Yeah, I straight up adore Lop and Ocho so fucking much. This is the strongest one for me. Now, uh, what about you, uh, Gibbs? Uh, my thoughts almost kind of mirror you, uh, Kevin, to an extent. Like, yeah, everything was pretty, was pretty on point, pretty fun. Uh, also Benui. Benui. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Benui. Very nice Benui. Um, Interestingly. Yeah. It, that, I, it made me kind of think, like, wow, Geno Studio, that is definitely a name I will definitely be looking looking for in the future that kind of thing if they're doing more work i'll definitely check them out i i might check out genocidal oregon even though i heard it's almost edgelord shit almost but yeah yeah i want to see more of what yuki igarashi has to go has to has has to offer on his own because this is yeah. his directorial debut 
and it slaps. <laughs> Very much. Yeah, it, it shows. Yeah, it, it really slaps. Yeah, it's great. Um, interesting thing about the whole bunny thing is this actually isn't the first bunny character in Star Wars media. Um, mm -hmm. So when they were developing the short, Yuki Igarashi actually asked his producer, who is like a massive Star Wars mega fan, uh, hey, is there another like rabbit-based character in Star Wars media that I can kind of base my own rabbit-based character on? Uh, turns out there is in the original Marvel comics that were that happened between like the 70s and the 90s. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. There was a rabbit alien named Zaxxon uh, who appeared in the stories there. Zaxxon was actually recently introduced into the main series lore uh, in 2018. So, uh, Lop is loosely based off of him. Um, Sorry, Zaxxon just sounds like something you take from migraines. Zax, a little bit. It's also an 80s arcade game, too. It is. That's, oh, that's where I know that from. Yeah, is that the one with, like, the flying star demon face? No, no that that's was... Sinistar. That's Sinistar. Right, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. The it's the isometric uh, shoot right. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, and, Zeke, you mentioned how... Um, this was like a backdoor pilot and whatever. Um, Yuki Igarashi, when he directed, when he developed this particular short, he wanted an ending that was fairly open ended, but you still got the feeling that at some point, uh, Lop and Ocho will reconcile. Mm. Like, you get this feeling that, like, they will well, at one for, point. Thanks for spoiling that. <laughs> it's like they will at one, at one point meet again and maybe they'll reconcile. Possibly. Yeah. But, like, he wanted to make a short that told its own narrative. Um, wasn't necessarily a closed narrative, but at the very least, it was something that was uh, satisfying when you actually got to the end of it. And I was I don't satisfied with this one. I don't necessarily agree, but I feel like he made a very good pitch for something better. I Yeah, okay. That's fair. So, yeah. Understandable. And... Hold on, my phone screen turned off. God damn it! <laughs> it's Akakiri by someone. I don't know. Yeah, uh, the last short is Akakiri, uh, which is the other Science Sider short, and this was done by Yun Young Choi. Uh, she is the co-founder of Science Sider, uh, next to Masaki Yuasa. Mm -hmm. Now, this one is the most interesting of the bunch for me because when I first saw it, I didn't know what to think of it, and I kind of disliked it. Yeah. I don't know what to think of it, and I dislike it. But the music was great. But watching yeah. it again, I kind of dig it. It's not I don't. like my favorite. It's not my favorite by any stretch. But I think it's actually a pretty good short. Um, Here's my problem: is that the first thing I really didn't like about it is that um, I, I wrote down here, "Nothing is predestined," says man whose religious order is partially founded on prophecies. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but how often have those prophecies actually happened? <laughs> That's not the point. The, po yeah. the point is that his entire belief system is structured around them, and he's like, nothing is predestined. And then we have a Sith talking about fate. Yeah, that is like, a little weird. <laughs> I feel like everything's topsy turvy in this one, and it's not like intentional or anything. I just feel like they don't understand what these factions are about. A little, a little bit, but um, uh. The overall take on this one is kind of a... It's kind of a twist on the Padme and Anakin story. You, okay, you call it a twist. I call it a pale imitation. Woo! Spicy! <laughs> Have Go you on. heard the story of Darth Plagueis the Wise? <laughs> like, it's literally just that. It, it kind of is. Yeah, this is basically just Darth Plagueis the Wise, but actually animated and not uh, called Darth Plagueis. Maybe he is Darth Plagueis. We don't fucking know. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was a woman. My issue with my issue with this short was I hated how it ends the anthology on kind of a downer note. That was my main overarching issue with this. Well, short, yeah. that I don't like how it was placed. I felt like maybe they could have placed it someplace 
other than the end other than the end of the anthology because i don't like the way it en- i don't like the way it ends at all it, it feels it's too much i don't like things ending on downers unless if it earns that downer or bittersweet or a pyric victory kind of thing yeah it's pyric but, but okay pyric yeah thank you i i didn't i've only heard i've only read that word i don't yeah, know okay. how to pronounce I, the gen i'm yeah. just coming from a place of genuine help <laughs> yeah thank you but um but anyway, um, but yeah, it was a, py- yeah, or like a Pyrrhic victory, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was, that's kind of my issue. I feel like downer endings have to be earned. You, d- you can't just put a downer ending in there just, just to, just to be artsy. You know, well, kinda. well, well, to me, well, it's because, um, to me, it's just because they're echoing or copying the Anakin Padme relationship, which, you know, uh, you can argue how well it was executed, but like with the amount of time investment a guy you could probably argue it was earned but here they have to do that in the span of uh, the understandable but 14 like... minutes or whatever yeah. well no i'm agreeing with you i'm saying it's a weakness is that like they're trying to replicate uh an arc that happened over three films in what was this, 15 minutes yeah so, you know just about yeah yeah, I I personally enjoyed it once I like rewatched it and kind of got a better perspective on what it was doing. Um, though I will admit, the biggest issue I did have when I originally saw it was the fact that this is a bleak short. <laughs> this, yeah, this short is fucking bleak. Um, I like that about it, but that's about the only thing I liked about it. <laughs> yeah, but again, it kind of ended it on a really downer note. Uh, well, I like having my expectations subverted, so, you know. Properly. Um, yeah. Properly subverting my expectations. And yep. there is an interesting note to make here about... Uh, so, I mentioned this when we were talking about the duel at the beginning, but... Yeah. Um, Cubes, you mentioned that uh, you were a little confused as to why the duel took influence from Seven Samurai and Yojimbo instead of Hidden Fortress as a Kurosawa work. Considering, no, it, I mean, considering that, considering that Hidden Fortress was like you know the blueprint for A New Hope. Yeah. Well, here the the two people who actually um, guide the main characters are based on characters from the Hidden Fortress. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Now that I didn't know. Yeah these these two characters are based off of the comic relief from the Hidden Fortress, uh, who were. Uh, by extension, what influenced C-3PO and R2-D2 in A New Hope. Um, Makes total sense. Yeah, the difference here being that unlike in The Hidden Fortress and unlike in uh, A New Hope, we don't actually start out with the comic relief. We actually start out with the Jedi character uh, as we directly follow his fall into the dark side. Mm -hmm. Um, Discount Anakin, yes. (laughs) But, Dollar store Anakin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I did find that to be an interesting little cultural note regarding this short, is that it took a little bit from the Hidden Fortress, which A New Hope already did. Um, this was just a more direct and blatant take from the Hidden Fortress, because these characters are basically just the same characters from the Hidden Fortress. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was the one thing I did like, was like... Uh, uh, because, you know, it brings the influences uh, full circle. And I guess, you know, when we move into our final, I guess if we move into our final thoughts, I guess there's something I kind of want to touch on in my final thought, you know, and it's kind of regarding the backlash. But, you know, I'll let y'all go off if you guys have nothing more to say about uh, the, the last one. Yeah. Kevin, remember, Kevin remember, remember when you told me you didn't think this had enough to be its own segment? <laughs> I did not <laughs> say that. <laughs> you told yes you did. I have proof. It's in my I, DMs. But my thing was that I thought this would go on too long. Which this has gone you on for an make, hour and a half. You did not make that clear. That was ambiguous. Okay, anyway. Um that said, uh final thoughts. I really like Star Wars Visions. I find it to be a very fascinating unique take on Star Wars, and there's a lot of stuff in here that I really really liked. Um the duel and Lapinocho are the two biggest standouts for me, um, and I also really liked um, the Village Bride. Um, 
I don't know, the more I think about the duel, the more and more I like it, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was a good start off. Yeah, yeah. It was, that's the thing I remember the most. Funny. See, for me, yeah, for me, uh, the duel and La Pinocha are like the only things that stand out, and the rest is just kind of a murky puddle of either meh or things that actively pissed me off, fucking Toby. Um, so, yeah, I give it I give it a 6 out of 10 by Mal, on Mal, and I stand by that. It's meh. When I picture, like, what I want out of a Star Wars anthology, it doesn't really look like this. Uh, I would give this personally an 8 out of 10, being more generous, because I liked a lot more about it than you did, <laughs> clearly. Yeah. And the things that pissed me off, like, weren't the same things that pissed you off. In fact, some of the things that pissed you off, I kind of liked. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Toby>. Yeah. <laughs> Man, it's, I wasn't expecting that short to be the diametric opposition between the two of us. You sure, thought, it, wasn't, you sure, wasn't, the el sure wasn't the Elder? Because the Elder had a lot of opposition. I don't know. I, I understand why you do like the Elder. I And even some elements of the Elder I actually do like. There's just like certain parts of that ju that just irk me to a degree. And it feels distinctly disappointing compared to everything around it. Com like me personally. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I really liked Star Wars Visions. Um, I hope we get another season of this. I, I want to see more anime creators take Star Wars and bring it in new directions. One of the biggest strengths of this particular anthology was that it wasn't bound by having to fit itself perfectly into canon. It could take place in canon timeline se sections, but it didn't have to play to the canon of everything else that, you know, the main franchise is. is, And it could just kind of play around. I want to see. I like, that, I like that conceptually, but I feel like they didn't take a lot of advantage of that. And I felt like they were mostly just focused on uh, uh, everybody needs a lightsaber and it's all Jedi and Sith all the time. Like. There's no point to me of breaking away from canon if you're just going to keep emulating it the whole time. I guess that's understandable. But uh, isn't there a short that apparently takes place after Rise of Skywalker? Um, yes, that was uh, The Ninth Jedi. <laughs> the Ninth Jedi, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, The Ninth Jedi takes place uh, hundreds of years after the events of Rise of Skywalker, after uh, the Sith Order has completely died off. Or so they think. The Sith and Jedi Order have, have died off, yeah. Um, and then it's back again. <laughs> it's yeah. Like it's like poetry. It kind of, it rhymes. Um, but yeah, what what are you what are your thoughts on this, Cubes? Uh, my thoughts on this are basically this: like, yeah, I give it like a real positive seven out of ten. Really fun. It was really fun to go through i really liked uh I, I really liked what i saw of this and if i'm being honest it it did kind of bring back the light in the star wars like for you i mean yeah i like the mandalorian granted i did see that before visions like i saw that like a I think like about a year and a half ago yeah. but um <laughs> that's i mean mandalorian's what brought me back uh star wars visions is gonna make me stay if I'm being honest, that's fair, and I'm yeah. I'm, I'm hoping Mandalorian is what makes me stay. <laughs> yeah, because because you... visions brought me back. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, that's that's my thing. It's like, yeah, I really do hope uh, if you do get to the Mandalorian, maybe we can like maybe talk about that maybe on our other show or whatever, or maybe uh, if Zeke wants to talk about, it, I guess we can talk about it here, you know, that kind of thing. But um, but yeah. Uh, this was a great little little bit of shorts. I mean, some were some were weak, some were eh, some, and some were great, like Lop and Ocho and the and the, fir and the first one. It was it was fun. So uh, yeah, that's basically my thoughts in the nutshell. Uh, anime, uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing me back to Star Wars. So <laughs> it's great. I love right. it. <laughs> All right, uh, I think that wraps up this segment. Yeah. Yep. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to do some Reddit diving in a bit. Catch oh you there. Boy. <laughs> Catch you there.
Welcome back to the Baka Gaijin Show, the third segment. We don't typically do those. Unless we have reason to. Which anyway, we do. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, anyway. So, I got a thing, you know, from uh, last week. So, uh, Zeke, remember you were talking about the guy that had, like, this big 77-inch TV and was, like, yeah. watching the news or something mm -hmm. like that? Yep. It's nothing to say to that. Um, as someone that like has researched buying an OLED TV, I hope to God that that TV is not an OLED because oh. holy shit, the burn in would be. Yeah, yeah. Because if you watch a lot of news, like like Fox News, you know NBC. Yeah, the logos like, and the, the the interface. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the the interface is just the 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 news graphics is just going to burn right the fuck in. So if yeah. you want CNN, OLED is definitely not for you. So I'm hoping he didn't buy an OLED. I'm hoping he just yeah. bought an OLED. But yeah, I yeah, obviously I, I can't tell that from 30 feet away in the parking lot. But yeah, I hope not. My soul just recoiled from hearing that. Yeah, it's a good Watching. point. I bought the I bought this three thousand dollar TV. When am I going to watch Fox News? <laughs> to, to be fair, those people are so indoctrinated they probably won't mind if the Fox News logo is permanently branded on their TV. <laughs> Unfortunately, they won't know why, but they'll they'll love it. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it is Reddit diving time. Everybody's Woo! favorite time. I just gotta pull up the fucking uh, my saved Reddit posts. I spent ten minutes talking with my sibling outside, and you didn't even bring up the Reddit posts. T shaking my head. S M H. S M H. My head. <laughs> let's see here. Okay, let's let's start with a Tifu. A today I fucked up. Although in this case, it's more of a that time I fucked up. But whatever. Oh boy. He calls it a small fuck up. I don't know if I'd call it a small fuck up. I think this guy has his priorities weird. He said, That time I fucked up by paying more than a thousand dollars to play Far Cry 5 when it first released. Oh dear God. Oh no. Ah, money fuck ups. Haven't had one Oblig of these. Obligatory. Yeah. Gone. Sorry. I'm good. Okay. Obligatory. This was not today, but three years ago. I'm in Australia. Oh, God. Games are super expensive in Australia. <laughs> Normally. Uh, so the 1000 in question was actually a UAD, AAUD, or about, a, about 770 US dollars or 670 euros. So I was 21 years old, absolute Far Cry fanatic at the time, just purchased the game for PC, but I didn't have home internet at the time, only mobile phone data. The contract I was on at the time oh. gave me, if I recall, about 50 gigs of data. And if I exceeded that, I had to pay $10 for every one gig I go over before the month was up. The big fuck up, I was already at the limit by the time I purchased the game, and being a fanatic, I just couldn't wait. I processed to download the full 30 gigs of Far Cry 5, costing me about $900 in fees. Uh. The most expensive game I've ever owned. Uh. And... Bruh! <laughs> I want to know, who... Who sets up their compute, their home computer? This is a PC player. He said to use their mobile phone data. That's a that's good weird. question. That's weird, that's weird to me. That's yeah. That is. Ugh. Just I'm pretty sure that download took like. Hours. I know the I know the internet's bad in Australia, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> Just pay for I mean, internet. Yeah. Holy shit! That I, I, I hope that was five. No, they didn't have 5G back back then. No. They were probably still like on four. On no, that was like 2018. It might have been. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, but even even so, I, the money's the real problem here. Yeah, uh, I don't. I would not consider that a small fuck up. This guy must be pretty well off if he considers spending 777 dollars on Far Cry 5 to be uh, a small fuck up. Dude, that would financially devastate me, and I would never recover. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd have a personal grudge against Far Cry for the rest of my life. <laughs> Just about. Mm -hmm. That was a short, shorty but goody. Here's here's an I am the asshole and I to post. And this one is just, it paints a, the picture of a funny character to me. Okay. Am, 
Am I the asshole for drinking whiskey in the office at 10.30 in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> More like, are you the dumbass? <laughs> yeah, you're the dumbass. I, okay, so I just like the, the way this guy talks about himself. I, 38-year-old male, work a stressful job in finance. Of course you do. After yeah. years of climbing my way up the corporate ladder, I finally became a VP at my firm, which comes with its own office. I consider myself a classic kind of guy, and one of those things I admire most about the workplaces of the 1960s, think Mad Men, etc., is that the characters always have a jar of whiskey in their hands, no matter what time of day it is. Oh my god. Back when I worked, back when I worked the trading floor, it would have been uncouth to do such a thing in front of my colleagues, but I figured no one would care about it now that I have my own office. I recently purchased some whiskey jars and a premium $500 bottle, which I store openly on my desk. I work with some high-end clients, and I always offer them a glass when we have important meetings. Unfortunately, none of them have ever accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so, not wanting to let the whiskey go to waste, I started sipping on a couple glasses by myself throughout the day, sometimes as early as 10.30 a.m. That was until yesterday morning when one of my bosses, the CTO, burst into the office unannounced and caught me sipping. He looked shocked, turned his back, and left. At this point, the bottle was about half empty, so it was probably looked pretty bad to him, although oh I must God. add, this, this was consumed over the course of a whole week. I was drinking slowly enough that it didn't affect my work in any way. Mm. He sent me a long email about how I have a problem and he's going to contact HR. In the heat of the moment, I sent him a reply telling him, maybe he needs a glass or two to lighten up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> He says, I'll admit to being the asshole for that part. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you were the smart yeah, you were the asshole on that one. I'm scheduled to speak to the HR tomorrow and I'm shitting it. Reddit, am I really the asshole for sipping whiskey privately in my office? Um you're not you're not the asshole, but you're not smart. <laughs> Yeah, this is the same here. Uh, you're not the asshole, but holy shit, dude, you're kind of a dumbass. <laughs> and I just like top comment. He's like, yes, YTA, you're the alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> and someone's like, I'm not just an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic who longs for the bygone times when being an alcoholic was sexy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone who thinks Don Draper is a character to emulate is an idiot, and I'm willing to bet nowhere near as attractive as John Hamm. <laughs> Opie's a childish obsession is what gets me. He's nearly 40 years old and a VP, but he's sad because he can't LARP as some alcoholic asshole he saw on a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. So... <laughs> That was funny. He was voted the asshole, and he edited the post. He says, it seems I'm the asshole. I'm going to ensure the whiskey and drinking is hidden from public view in the future. No drinking before lunchtime. Still sucks that I don't get to be Don Draper, though. <laughs> what? I have not seen Mad Men, so I can't really take heads or tails if that's a thing or a bad thing. I'm going to assume bad thing. He gave me a, he gave, not me, he gave Reddit a final update where he said, oh boy, I met with the HR lady early this morning and I very stupidly, out of pure reflexive habit, offered her a drink before we started. <laughs> no, no, God, no. <laughs> she, was, she was not amused to say the least. After that, I basically got on my knees and begged for forgiveness. <laughs> They've let me keep my job, but I'm relegated to sitting at a tiny desk in a shared office under the constant eye of the CTO. Moreover, word has gotten around the floor about my old school antics. I've already got a couple of colleagues jokingly calling me Donnie Boy and even asked me for whiskey themselves. You know, I'll take it, but this isn't what I imagined being a madman would be like. <laughs> Finally, instead of drinking it at work, I've decided to give the remainder of this bottle to my wife. Lord knows she'll need it, being married to Don Draper. <laughs> I'm glad he has a sense of humor about it. Do, 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 do. God, damn it. Oh, uh, okay. I, I, the, the, the part that fucking killed me was where the HR manager comes in and he's immediately like, Hey, do you want a drink? <laughs> That's yeah. why I'm here. Oh my god. Marvelous. Very fun. I think it would be even funnier if she didn't come to him, but he went to their office and he just brought the bottle with him <laughs> by instinct. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. These real life LARPers. This this is so amusing. Madmen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
All right. This is a, this is an old this is a very famous post. I don't know if either of you have heard of it before. This is one of those you know if you're a redditor you probably know this, but it's a very it's a very fun story. Uh, the original post was on our relationships for relationship advice. This was actually deleted, but it was saved and uploaded to our copy pasta. Oh no! So it goes. My I'm a 25 year old female boyfriend 25 year old male keeps asking me to invest in his soup tube business idea and i'm not sure how to deal with it oh god the soup tube no i've heard this oh. one okay go 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 okay okay i'll tell you uh you haven't heard it cube no i have not i'm not really a hardcore redditor if i'm being real yeah. all right so I have been living with my boyfriend for about seven months. Two weeks ago, he sat me down and presented a PowerPoint presentation about his business idea. I knew he'd been working on something, but he didn't want to tell me about it until it was finished. Based on his enthusiasm and prior seemingly intelligent nature, I thought it might be a pretty cool idea. Instead, he presented me an idea about soup tubes. The idea, if you can call it that, is to construct a series of tubes throughout our city that lead to a centralized soup kitchen, and for a monthly subscription, a customer can subscribe to a tube of soup, and a tube extension will be built off the nearest mainline tube and directly into the customer's apartment or home. Based on subscription level, that would determine the quantity of soup a customer could pour and how many types of soup. The soups are basically the size. The tubes are basically the size of pipes, like you might see under a sink. But he insisted that it must be called a soup tube, not a soup pipe. Tube just zings better. <laughs> I could not believe what I was hearing. At first I asked if he was crank yanking me or something, but he was completely sincere. Obviously this idea is completely fucking insane. The notion that a city would authorize somebody constructing a series of tubes everywhere that carry soup into homes is of course ludicrous. <laughs> and even if such an initiative were approved, the costs, the costs for such an operation would be ridiculous. You'd have to charge outrageous prices for customers to install and subscribe to a soup tube and would pay for such, and who would pay for such a service when canned soup costs like a dollar? Or you could just buy soup from a restaurant for a few dollars. And I explained these things as politely as I could, but he dismissed them and said, all said that tube-based soup delivery is the way of the future. <laughs> he then asked me how much I wanted to invest, and I told him nothing, and he looked absolutely heartbroken. Since then, almost every day, he's asked me again to invest and keeps telling me, trying to sell me on the idea. He's also doing the same thing to a lot of his friends, and it's starting to drive me up a wall. First... I'm at a loss as to how we can believe such a stupid idea is worthwhile. Second, it's really goddamn annoying to be constantly asked on a daily basis to invest in a system of soup tubes. And third, I'm concerned for his sanity. Other than his apparent obsession with this, he has shown no other signs. I would like some advice as to how to reason with them, or whether I should even consider, consider this relationship. Divorce. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't gonna work. Knock it off. <laughs> oh my god. The fucking soup tube, man. This is one of those few Reddit stories I actually have heard, and I love this so much. Just it's... the pure absurdity, and the fact that he is just so deeply in his delusion that he is just completely sold in the, on the idea of a soup tube infrastructure for a subscription service to soup tubes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A series of tubes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a series of tips. God. The comment was like, there are many issues with this idea. You'd only really get one kind of soup without constantly mixing different kinds of soup residue. Many people out there have food-related allergies. It would cost way more money than it's worth. Given viruses, it wouldn't be a very sanitary situation. And most importantly, we do not live in the Jetsons. <laughs> we don't. No, soup we tubes do are the way of the future. <laughs> I think we've decided what the way of the future is, and it's shit like Grubhub and shit. Like, I don't get... It seems like such an obvious thing to, to a functioning brain to be like, why don't you just deliver soup? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking, too. Why this complex system of soup broth? What, what, how would it go? Would it be soup broth that would that you filter down? Yeah. Like, do, you need a, do you need a separate pipe constructed for every different type of soup so they don't contaminate each other? Yeah, that's 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 a that's that's kind of weird, champ. Not gonna lie, it's just such a nonsensical. Some people some people have claimed that this story is fake, 
but either way, it is highly entertaining, and I love it. Now, there are people who are crazy enough to actually believe that soup tubes are a viable business option. <laughs> yeah, I believe that, too. I mean, I've thought of my own half-baked ideas a few times, not not as batshit as this one. This one's pretty bad, admittedly. <laughs> God. Mm -hmm. Soup tube. Let's see. <laughs> Let's go for let's go for an R glitch in the matrix story. Ooh, fun. Oh my, let's go. Can't wait for existential know. dread. <laughs> if you don't know, uh Glitch in the Matrix is a subreddit where people basically post experiences that they can't explain. You know, the things that could potentially uh lead one to believe we live in some sort of massive simulation, hence glitch in the matrix. So this one is titled Night Drive. I'd like to start by saying that I was never one to believe in the Matrix or anything of the sort until this experience. <laughs> I'm trying to come to some sort of explanation aside from a glitch, but I have not been able to find any resolution to this. It's not scary, spooky, or some time traveler thrown through space time to our dimension or timeline. It's just weird. I was driving through the streets near my house around 9.30 p.m., so it was dark and oddly quiet for a weekend night. I live in a college town in Southern California with a vibrant nightlife, so not seeing a single car or pedestrian on the first three miles of a major road was extremely unusual. But I didn't think much of it until I came down a large hill and around the bend at the bottom. I, it was a sweeping left bend with a speed limit of 45 miles per hour. I saw taillights ahead right at the end of the bend. I noticed I was getting closer fast and checked my speed, about 45 miles an hour. I slowed down quick and approached the cars ahead of me. I slowed down to four, from 45 to 10. The cars were stopped. No stoplight, no stop sign, accident, hazard, animal, nothing. I realized they were all stopped in perfectly spaced out intervals alternating between left and right lane. I felt an odd sensation through my body, like a static vibration, what I would compare to a TV static emanating from my bones the closer I crept up to the cars. All the cars were vehicles that did not come with a manual option, so they were all automatic transmission vehicles, newer cars. None of the cars had brake lights on, uh, stopped without engaging brakes, the sound of cars non-existent. As I pulled up next to a car in the left lane, I crept up to look at the person in the car, and as soon as I broke that perfectly spaced out interval, all the cars started moving at once. No engines starting, no gears being changed, no handbrakes being disengaged, all of a sudden just movement by like seven different cars. There was no slinky effect like traffic always has. All seven cars from front to rear began moving at about the exact same time. That static feeling I had wore off the further I got from where the cars had stopped. I passed the cars once I had a chance, and all the drivers were expressionless. They didn't look over at me. They didn't show any sign of acknowledgement or of what just happened. Is in, do, do you think anyone can give me any insight or know what's happening here? Thanks. Hmm. The fuck? That is a really weird one. That would kind of weird me out, too, mm -hmm. if, I'm, you know, if I was in that situation. But, yeah. You got yeah. Have some, and you know, people are putting in the usual suggestions. Uh, investigate your mental state. Are you were you just really tired? Um, were you on anything? You know, did you confuse it for a dream? That sort of thing, which is the usual response to these sort of things. Now, a glitch in the matrix is kind of infamous, along with other similar subreddits, for being kind of a hub for creative writers to sort of yeah. you know test their metal and write a believable story or whatever so right you know, there's obviously a, a good deal of skepticism that goes into these um but i do like i do like subreddits like this even if some of the even if i know that a lot of them are probably fake um you know i enjoy i enjoy a good tale for one but also you know on the off chance that it's not it it gives you something to think about and yeah. i think I, get, I think everybody has had experiences that one way or another they find difficult to explain yeah so I just wanted to share that. God, that that does remind me of a fun little 4chan green text. I, I saw one time where, like, this guy was confused about how, like, he it was, like, the middle of the night, something like midnight or whatever, and he was just kind of laying up in his bed, just staring at the ceiling. And according to him, it's like, I didn't feel tired at all, and I didn't feel, like, sleep coming on or anything. But then I blinked, and suddenly it was morning. It was so weird. What is this glitch in the Matrix? And someone was just like, you fell asleep, idiot. 
<laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. I actually, I actually asked my when I took psychology, I asked about that phenomenon to my professor, and she's like, "Yeah, that just means you fell asleep. It just means you had a, you had a dreamless sleep, and, you know, it just lined up the certain way where you just didn't remember falling asleep." Yeah. That 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 happens. I just love that you fell asleep, idiot. Mm -hmm. Just the bluntness. Was sleep. Yeah. Uh, that's what that's a four chance for. Uh. Let's go. Let's go back to an Ita. Am I the asshole for making my daughter sleep in the backyard after what she did to her housemate? Yes. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but, well. I don't. I don't need to hear it. All I'm saying is you are. Yeah. <laughs> but let's see how much of an asshole the daughter is. We'll see. That's the yeah. fun part. We'll see. I'm a 46 year old male. My daughter, age 16, is a high school junior. I noticed recently that she's been behaving in a bad manner, constantly commenting on other people's looks, their belongings, calling them stuff that isn't cool, just being insensitive. It's like she lost a filter or something, because usually she was polite, but my wife suspected our daughter's sudden misbehavior occurred after she started hanging out with the new girls from school. Uh, of course. Basically, the mean type and have picked on their behavior. I've sat with my daughter and have had many discussions about her behavior and have has been negatively affecting everyone around her. Our housemaid is the person most affected here, and my daughter has chosen to be her to be the target for hair, clothing, adequate criticism. She's complained about our daughter. The housemate has complained about our daughter calling her offensive names like filthy and gross for cleaning certain areas of our house. I took a stand and explicitly told my daughter I'd punish her if she ever said stuff like that to our housemate again. Last week, my daughter had a party to go to. Earlier that day, she called her housemate filthy, so I grounded her by not letting her go to the party. She threw a fit and called her housemate a liar, saying she never called her that, and that was the end of that. Days later, my daughter came to me saying that she couldn't find her iPhone after looking everywhere. I asked me, She asked me to call her number, and I did. My wife and I were stunned to discover the iPhone was ringing inside our housemate's bag. I had a com confrontation with her immediately, that, and she denied and cried, saying she never touched the phone, nor had any idea how it got there. I noticed my daughter calling her thief repeatedly, so I told her to stop and go to her room. I checked the indoor camera before continuing the argument and saw my daughter place her <laughs> iPhone inside her housemate's bag. All right. Yeah. And, I, and I was livid. Shot in 4K, yep. <laughs> Uh, I was livid. I apologized to the housemaid and gave her the rest of the day off. I then showed the video to my daughter, and she was absolutely speechless. D how does the daughter oh. not know that you have security cameras around the house? What the fuck? Oh, yeah, it'd be a fly on the wall for that moment. I said what she did was immoral and straight up offensive to tamper with that poor woman's livelihood over a petty party she couldn't go to. I told her she was grounded and will have to spend the night in the backyard. Also, she is a germaphobe. <laughs> but she cried, begging me not to make her sleep with the dirt, insects, and hot temperature. I refused to discuss it, or I'd make it two nights. What a Chad move. My wife said I should go easy on her, but said calling people filthy and accusing them of stealing was not okay. In fact, it was the absolute worst. And then I went through with my punishment. The reason I chose this punishment was because of the fact my daughter says that she's a germaphobe and uses this as an excuse to insult others' hygiene and appearance. Our backyard has dirts and bugs and this kind of thing that gets her uncomfortable, but other than that, the backyard is 100% safe. Did she at least get a tent? I He doesn't see. He doesn't clarify. Okay. Um... Probably the asshole in that you probably took it a little too far, but at the same time, she would be in a fucking bitch. <laughs> yeah, that was a yeah. bitch move. No, nope. yeah, man, this is one of those stories where nobody's in the right. <laughs> yeah, the daughter's the asshole, but you took the punishment a little too next. That was the punishment's a little too next level. You didn't have to go that far, chief. See the. See, the funny thing is the comments think you guys are wrong because really? the top com the top comment here is not the asshole, but you should give your housekeeper a week off with pay and make your daughter take her place unpaid. <laughs> okay, that's a better punishment. Yeah. <laughs> that's a better pu I would have gone with that one. That would have been good. That would have been really yeah. good. <laughs> Th this is this is the appropriate discipline. Put them in so the other person's shoes. Mm -hmm, uh, teaching the empathy and whatnot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like Undercover Boss, except it actually works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Somebody went re- somebody went even further. I was like, go online and print out websites for military boarding schools out of state that take females. Tell her if she doesn't straighten up immediately, there will be consequences. Then call applications department and put it on speakerphone. Also, make sure that she knows the day she turns 18, you don't owe her anything. Man, this guy had great parents, I can tell. Jesus Christ. Damn. There's a, there's, a, there's a type of person whose default response to any parenting trouble is, just tell them they're going to military boarding school. <laughs> 90s trope, that kind of thing. Like, yeah. you know, if you don't, if you don't lighten up, if you don't, uh, if you... If you don't buckle down, I'm sending you to military school. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a movie trope. It's that they'll get the electric chair. I'll sell you off to the gypsies. <laughs> <laughs> My permanent record. Your permanent record. I think I made that tweet like a while ago where I'm like, you know what? They made, a lot of media made a big deal about my permanent record, but I've never seen it or it's never been a factor in my life yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah, I remember I'm, that. I'm questioning whether it exists. It's Where is question. it? Who has it? Who knows? The story is not about him, but I think that commenter might just be an asshole himself. Yeah, I, th- I think that I think that commenter is the biggest asshole. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's see. Okay. Am I the asshole for asking my tall girlfriend to not wear heels? Hmm. We'll see. This guy, this guy is age 25, male. His girlfriend, 25 female, is very tall. She is 1.81 meters tall. I don't know what that is because I only speak American. <laughs> and he's 1.75 meters tall. I don't know what that means. Anyway, she's taller than him. Her family is also extremely tall. Her dad and her brother are both over 1.9 meters. Her mother's like three centimeters shorter than me. These are all nonsense words. My girlfriend's family likes to joke about other people. They say that they have a dark humor, but I prefer to say they're assholes. Whatever. <laughs> In the three years my girlfriend have been together, I've been the target of jokes surrounding my height or me, a man dating a woman taller than me. I've tried to get them to stop, but it's useless. Now, my girlfriend loves to wear heels. She has a new pair that at least makes her about 10 centimeters taller. She wants to wear them to a formal dinner we're having with her family. I just know that her family will have something to say about me being shorter than her, especially with the heels she wants to wear. So I asked her if she could please change her heels to ones that are not that tall or not wear heels that day, explaining my reasoning behind my petition. I even apologized for asking that and told her that I just want a peaceful evening with no offensive comments towards me. My girlfriend got super mad at me and said I'm making her insecure, and if I couldn't handle a joke, then I shouldn't go to dinner. She's been giving me the cold shoulder for three days now and refuses to talk to me when I either try to apologize or explain to her again why I asked that. Oh, you're insecure! (laughs) Holy shit. No, you're not the asshole. She is. What the fuck? Yeah, it's just like, you know, I just, I'm kind of tired of these jokes. You know, I don't want to fucking hear it right now. Yeah, like, uh, that's a reasonable request. Top comment is, asking your girlfriend not to wear heels isn't going to fix your insecurities about the height difference or the fact your girlfriend and her family treat you terribly. You should just break up with her. I mean, if this is such, like, uh, it's kind of obvious she doesn't really care that much about his personal feelings if something is, if, if something like this is like oh you don't it's it's like oh you don't care about me you're so you're making me feel so insecure it's like bitch you make him feel so insecure by constantly joking yeah. about this shit not even thinking about how he feels about it even though it clearly yeah. makes him uncomfortable the fuck is your issue most people replied uh and the thread was ultimately voted as everyone sucks here um, huh? your girlfriend's your girlfriend sucks for not defending you from her family even when you asked him to stop with the height jokes and you suck for projecting your insecurities to your girlfriend it's not her fault she's tall and likes wearing heels yeah uh... everyone sucks here the issue cannot be fixed by policing her shoes it does sound like you're a bit insecure about being shorter than her that's on you not them but people who defend bullying by calling it a joke are worse and not to talk to you for three days is just over the top and she should be taught a talking point telling her family to knock it off, not telling you to suck it up. Uh, yeah. I think it just... It just... You know, I, I feel like I waver somewhere in between everyone sucks and you're not the asshole. I, yeah. I, feel, I, I don't feel like this guy sucks that much. I feel like he's just reached a breaking point after three years of yeah. this bullshit. One way or the other, I think he needs out of this relationship. Ultimately, yeah. I think that's what's best for him. He needs a relationship that isn't going to be... 
so constantly making him feel insecure about himself, but, like, he does admittedly need to, you know, learn to get over that to a degree, but it's also on the other people for exploiting that, realizing that, and making it into a joke, and just mm-hmm. brushing it off. It's like, it's just a joke, bro. It's just a joke. Lighten up, bro. It's just a joke, bro. Yeah. 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 I think everyone sucks here, but not everyone sucks equally. Fair. Yeah. yeah. That's, I feel like I'm kind of on the everyone sucks, but he's not the butthead here, so. Yeah. And let's wrap up with a hobby drama post. That time Warner Brothers announced a fake live action Frosty the Snowman movie to distract people from allegations of workplace harassment. Huh? Oh. Do, do you remember the fake live action Frosty the Snowman movie? No, sir. No, okay. I do not. <laughs> Well, I'm going to skip this first part where he's like, this is what the DCEU is, and this was what the release the Snyder Cut was. We all know that story. Yeah. Yeah. Stepping ahead, on June 29th, 2020, Ray Fisher, who played Cyborg in Justice League, put out a tweet. In it, it was a video of him at uh, at Comic-Con saying a bunch of nice things about Joss Whedon, everyone's favorite guy. Standard press tour stuff. But his text for the tweets reads, I'd like to take a moment to forcefully retract every bit of that statement. Naturally, fans were intrigued and wanted to know more. Why did Fisher suddenly have problems with Whedon? Two days later, on July 1st, he expanded on his tweet saying Joss Whedon's onset onset treatment of the cast and crew of Justice League was gross, abusive, unprofessional, and completely unacceptable. He also accused producers Jeff Johns and John Berg of enabling the abuse. Naturally, fans are upset. On top of all the production problems and bad films, now it seemed as though they were enabling harassment and shitty workplace behavior. It was clear Warner Brothers needed to respond in some way. And they did! in the weirdest way possible. <laughs> Frosty, no. the, Frosty the Snowman was a six foot four Hawaiian with a beard and facial scar. <laughs> what? On, July, on yeah. July 1st, 2020, coincidentally the same, way, the same day that Ray Fisher accused them of enabling abuse, Warner Brothers announced via deadline that they were developing a live action Frosty the Snowman movie with Frosty voiced by Fisher's co-star Jason Momoa and the film being produced by Jeff Johns and John Berg. This Remember? was odd for a couple of reasons first a live action frosty the snowman movie who wanted this second jason momoa as frosty momoa is known for playing massive badasses covered in muscles because he's a massive badass covered in muscles seemed like a really bad miscasting and thirdly it was interesting that john berg and jeff johns the producers currently under fire were the ones producing jeff johns involvement was especially suspicious as a movie producer he had exclusively produced films based on dc properties why the sudden shift to the main character of a Christmas song? But all of these questions went back to the back of fans' minds when Jason Momoa revealed that Warner Brothers just made the whole thing up. <laughs> uh, on, Smith- sept- on September 14th, 2020, Jason Momoa made an Instagram post detailing his support for Ray Fisher and Fisher's claims of how the cast and crew retreated during the Justice League reshoots. But the most interesting part of his post is, quote, I just think it's fucked up that people released a fake Frosty announcement without my permission to try and distract from Ray Fisher speaking up about the shitty way we were treated on the Justice League reshoots. If we're to believe Jason Momoa and understand him correctly, this is what Warner Brothers did. When faced with accusations of workplace harassment, Warner Brothers chose to try and distract fans from them by announcing a fake live-action Frosty the Snowman movie starring the biggest miscasting till Chris Pratt is Mario. <laughs> and, produced, <laughs> and produced by two of the main producers under fire. The fans' heads were filled with questions. Why make a fake announcement? Why not announce a project they were actually working on? If it had to be fake, who came up with live-action Frosty? Why was that their idea? Why not consult Jason Momoa beforehand to make sure he's okay with this? How did you expect him to not reveal your shitty, weird plan? All of these questions or more are unlikely to ever be answered. The Aftermath. I haven't heard any news about this Frosty movie since Jason Momoa said it was fake. No news on whether or not it's actually real, whether or not Warner Brothers has admitted to it being faked. Ray Fisher gave another interview earlier this year going into more detail about Whedon's abuse. Along with Momoa, Gal Gadot also spoke up about Whedon's actions. Warner Brothers promised to open an investigation into their claims, and the DCEU has kept trucking along. But if fans have any faith in the DCEU, it isn't because of Warner Brothers, and the frosty debacle did not help any. (laughs) Oh my god, I... I think I vaguely remember Frosty the Snowman, like, trending around the time that was going on back in, like, what, like December 2020, whatever the fuck, whatever the hell it was. Mm-hmm. 
I think I vaguely remember something like that, but like I didn't pay it any mind because I thought it was stupid and I, it just wasn't something that I wanted to even give an iota of brain power to think about. But like the fact that they, oh my god, so much about this is just completely absurd. The big one being, you do realize Jason Momoa is likely to... Why did they not talk to Jason Momoa about this and just be like, oh yeah, Jason Momoa is frosty, even though he also worked on Justice League and probably has just as much to say about Joss Whedon as Ray Fisher does? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind, that's kind of that's kind of bash backwards and kind of fucked up. It, it is was a weird, shitty plan, and I, I get the feeling maybe the idea was it's so absurd it'll distract from everything else. But in retrospect, this is just fucking weird. It just drew more attention to it. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's just so out of nowhere and no, no part of it makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I either must have purged it from memory or it was just not significant enough for me to even think about. You know, that, I think that's why I don't fucking remember it. It's such a strange little footnote in the entire, like... Joss Whedon, DCEU, Justice League, Zack Snyder, fucking massive goddamn bullshit that was happening. It's such a weird notch in that entire story. Someone, Somebody commented, do you think the Frosty movie weirdness was because they were cobbling together stuff that would take over in searches if people were looking for scandal keywords? That's the only reason I can think of is uh, to attach these producers. Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, that, that's about the only thing I can think of, logically. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Yep. And then most of the comments are just debates about the DCU in general, which is not super relevant. Yeah, but... That... But yeah, that's, that's, just, that's just a weird fucking thing that happened and Warner Brothers probably wants us to forget about. <laughs> Too bad, the internet's forever, bitch. Mm -hmm. yeah. You may want us to forget, but Reddit never will. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's all I got this week. Some good, some good posts. I hope it was nice, short and sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was fun. Yes, really fun. I think we had a we had a good episode today, gentlemen. Yes, quite. Mm -hmm. I quite enjoyed myself. Yep. And uh, you can find us on Twitter at Zeke Freak, at Citramon Briquet, and at QA the Third. If you have comments, questions, or topic suggestions, you can email us at bakagaijinshow at gmail .com. Or you could also join our official Discord server. Link in the description. You got anything else to plug? No, I think I'm good. Uh, you can check us out on uh, Otaku Midnight. Uh, we That's actually true. have our own uh, standalone channel now for Otaku Midnight. So uh, oh, That's right, we do. <laughs> yeah. We keep forget. Uh, you keep forgetting it's a thing, but yeah, we do have that, and uh, we should have more episodes out soon. Uh, I'm hoping to do more with Saradin if as soon as I can find like you know a time that lines up. Uh, I might be doing more stuff soon, but you know shit's been crazy, you know, on my end. So mm -hmm. yeah, personal shit. But uh, but yeah, uh, that's where you can find me. You can find me on Twitter. This shit posts in the way. So mm -hmm. yeah subscribe and hit that bell yes and uh yeah good show and uh next week we might have another special guest potentially yeah so look forward to that this has been the baka gaijin show i'm zeke freak ciao ciao for now <laughs>